Welcome back to Kind of Funny Star Wars in Review. That's right. We are ranking and reviewing every movie in the Star Wars cinematic universe. I'm Tim Geddes. This is Andy Cortez. Good and morning. We got Nick Scarpino. Hello, everyone. We got Barrett on the boards. Boss Baby himself. Kevin Coelho out at a wedding. Um, so he had to just send me his, his ranking and thoughts separately. Don't read any of them. Yeah. Yeah, it's fucking. You know Who what cares, I mean? Dude. This is our chance. Who gives just a cut shit? him out. Dude. Either here <laughs> or you're against us. Just like, just like Star Wars, there's so <laughs> much space here. You know? yeah, there's so much more episodes. space. You got to it's, it's amazing that Kevin only takes up the space of one human, but really it's like five humans. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, has, yeah, he yeah, takes yeah. up the energy of five humans. Okay. It's not so fair. There's all these wires and stuff that make you guys get really close together. I'm just saying. I'm just trying to. Barrett blames the wires. I'm just defending my boy. I'm like Kevin. that. You're like that weird casino uh, planet on the next Star Wars that we're, we haven't watched yet, where everything's <laughs> neutral and weird and gray area. Stop it. You're either with us or against us. I'm you're against light or dark, that. buddy. He just called you a planet. You're dude. Canto Biden. Yeah, you're fucking Canto Biden. <laughs> oh, future spoilers, everybody. Uh, this is kind of funny. Star Wars in review. Uh, like I said, we are ranking and reviewing all of the movies. We've been doing this. Uh, we are also going. The reason we're doing two this week. We already already did episode three. Revenge of the Sith. Um, We're doing episode seven, The Force Awakens today, because next week there are two episodes of The Mandalorian, and we're going to try to not rank and review those, just review those. We're, so we're similar do, to Game of Thrones. Similar to Game of Thrones, where we're going to get the crew together to talk about just it. It's a big moment, fun, man. Yeah. First ever live action Star Wars. I didn't realize series. that Bill Burr's in it. I'm in. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I yeah. saw I, I saw him in the thing. I'm in like, that guy looks interesting and bald. And then someone's like, it's Bill Burr. I'm like, whoa. I'm in. Yeah. I'm in. So, Isn't it wild that Bill Burr like can say I'm one of the most successful comedians and I've been in Breaking Bad and The Mandalorian? It's wild. <laughs> it's really cool. It's really weird. You got to love it. So we're going to try that. Uh, just have some fun. And bear with us scheduling wise. We, we don't exactly know when The Mandalorian is going to come out time wise. We know day wise. So. Stay tuned to uh, twitter.com slash kindoffunnyvids for more info on all of that. But you can get this show live on twitch.tv slash kindoffunnygames, or you can get it later on youtube.com slash kindoffunny, roosterteeth.com, or podcast services around the globe. Just search for Kinda Funny Reviews. Uh, today we are talking about Star Wars Episode Seven: The Force Awakens, thanks to our Patreon producers, Al Tribesman. The lone tribesman, the, the lone, lone hunter. The lone he's out hunter. there by himself, but yeah. he's, he's part of a tribe, but he by himself. He just wants some candy. And like yeah. all of his crew is gone. On a, on a, he's, but he's on a desolate planet. He doesn't know if anybody else But is they alive. just went to the mall without him because he yeah. didn't feel like getting food That's for it that <laughs> Star Wars Episode Seven: The Force <laughs> Awakens, released December 18th, 2015, 10 years after Revenge of the Sith. Awesome. Uh, directed by J.J. Abrams, an American filmmaker and comic book writer. He's known for his work. In the genres of action, drama, and science fiction, Abrams wrote or produced such films as Regarding Henry in 1991, Forever Young in 1992, Armageddon in 1998, Cloverfield in 2008, Star Trek, Star Wars Force Awakens, Star Wars Rise of Skywalker. The list goes on and on. We know him well. Mission He's created 3. numerous television series, including Felicity. Super 8. Alias, right? Oh, no. Felicity. Well, and alias, and alias, alias as well. Yeah. Yeah. And Lost, to a degree, um, right? Wasn't he one of the producers mm-hmm. on Lost? Yep. Yeah. So there you go. His directorial film work includes Mission Impossible 3, Star Trek, Super 8, I Star mean, Trek Into The more Darkness. important of these that he did, right, is obviously I credit him with jump-starting the mission, not only the Mission Impossible franchise, but also the, the new Star Trek franchise. Mm-hmm. He did the he's, oh, he literally jump-started Star Trek, and then they were like, hey, you did such a great job with that Kirk one. Let's come over here and have you jump-start the next trilogy for Star Wars, Absolutely. which is insane. Totally, totally insane. I remember watching... And I... Fucking love the 2009 Star Trek. Oh my god, it's, me too. It's the amazing. intro it's amazing. makes me cry. I can't even think about the intro where he's like Tiberius. No, that's the worst. He's crying Let's right name now. Let's your dad. Let's name him James. Hell he's yeah. crying right now. Look yeah. at him. He's got crying. He got, got him. He's yeah. crying. Yeah. He's human. Yeah. Andy. Wow. Oh my god. I learned how to cry. <laughs> I know, I know now why you cry. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I thought you were gonna go. In. I thought so too, but I was up bug. for it. Just oh, you! I love it. You gotta Shout love out it. Shout to young Chris Hemsworth. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. absolutely, Gorgeous. absolutely. Who would have thought his career would have been the better of the two Chris's in that movie? Right. Yeah, well, go. what's crazy is I remember obviously this new Star Wars Episode Seven, huge for all of us, where it huge. came out of nowhere. Disney buying Star Wars. What the fuck? So much hype. Uh, Nick and I made the short on IGN of the Star Wars Seven director chosen. Yeah, you should go YouTube that if you want some fun. Yeah. Uh, J.J. Abrams, the first one we named. First one. Last I one was t- Joss Whedon, who I still was. stand by. I think he could have done been, a great job with, great. That, with that middle one. Uh, but the thing the thing for us is that J.J. Uh, Abrams, we knew he was directing Episode 7 
as Star Trek Two came out. And I remember watching Star Trek Two Into Darkness, and granted, I don't think it's as good as 2009 Star no. Trek, but it was still a fun movie. But the beginning was so great with the volcano planet mm-hmm. and like Were the they running look from of the, it. From the really people. Good. And I remember being in the theater and watching that and being like, "We're about to get a Star Wars that feels like this." Yeah. And then we did. Like, yeah, that's, we did. The, that's the coolest bit. Yeah. All right, going into it here, uh, directed by J.J. Abrams, a budget of. I couldn't get real numbers. This is kind of weird. Three hundred and six million gross, two hundred fifty eight point six million net. Let me call of Kathy. A budget? Yeah, I'm imagining this is three hundred million dollars as a budget at least. Yeah, it's least. it's weird seeing it though, like presented this way, because even the the amount made had some weird numberings and stuff. Like I always get it from the same source, so I don't know why it did this. But uh, box office of two point six eight. Two point zero six eight billion dollars. Yeah. I think. What did they spend on Star Wars? Didn't they spend like six billion to buy the Star Wars franchise from Lucas, and then was they made it back in like or two four. films? I think. It was, yeah, please look it up. Maybe it was four, but I, like Marvel was four. Man, they made that shit back fast. Yeah, Lucas was like that. You know, it's like when you do a negotiation, you're like, I'll take ten dollars. The guy's like, Sure. And you're like, Damn sure, it! I should have asked for twenty. Yeah. Hey, you they were so asked. down to I give was, me that much. Damn yeah. it. But the thing there is, I don't think Lucas could have made that much mm. if he made more Star Wars movies. At that point, yeah, I mean, I don't know who knows. Because I mean, if you look at the numbers of Revenge a, of the Sith and like of the prequels, like, oh, I think Disney buying it out gave, I definitely gave it new energy. Yeah, especially coming off like you're talking, we are midway through the fucking hotness that is what like Phase Two of Marvel mm-hmm. when they bought this, when they bought the, the the thing. So yeah, of course they're coming in with a lot of good grace from the audience right here, yeah. and then they cut and they announced J.J. Abrams, and everyone's like, okay, it's in good hands. Mm-hmm. This dude is like Spielberg's protege. There, there were and Spielberg some should have directed some of the original or, or the original uh, the prequels. He should have directed all of those. There were some people that weren't feeling the J.J. Abrams pick. There, were, there, there was uh, a, a decent amount of the fan base that was like, they're going with the guy who was the most predictable, the most vanilla sort of director, the guy who's going to not necessarily give us a story that's going to make you think. It's just kind of going to be very surface level. I feel like a lot of that came after the movie came out. Really? I could have sworn like leading up to it. There was a little bit of that. Leading up to it, I feel like that we have never seen such a perfect storm of marketing where it it felt like they could do no wrong, where every single trailer they put out uh, got just pure, just positive reactions. And on top of that, like any behind the scenes thing they did, every decision they made where they're like, and this is practical, and this is practical, and take a look at this story. Everyone's I mean, just the like, the fact that they shot shit. out on 35 millimeter film. All of those decisions. Was this sm- he was like, I want it to look and feel like one of the original trilogies, not the prequels. I want to shoot it on film. I guess they wanted to shoot it on IMAX, but it was just prohibitively expensive. So he was like, let's shoot it on 35. Let's make everything as practical as humanly possible. And it's so crazy coming off of Revenge of the Sith, where everything is so. It's jarring. Shiny, so digital and so fake and so blurry and glowy and like that. None of the actors know what they're doing. To a the very first scene of this that just feels like a Spielberg action movie. It feels mm-hmm. like a Star Wars movie that, that the way it should feel. It feels like Indiana Jones because the, it's the weirdest thing. There's a but when you put really yeah. good actors in front of real shit and they're running around in the desert and, sh- and real shit's blowing up, you get real reactions from them. Yeah. Wild. May the facts be with you. Uh, coming in early here, there's only one shot in this entire movie that uh, is on a pure green screen. Which one is that? The Han Solo death scene. Oh, that makes oh. sense, though. Yeah. Well, That's a badass looking scene. And, and it was because they JJ just didn't know exactly what he wanted that to be to until look like, like they yeah. were in the edit and they're like, all right, well, we, this is what the look should be. Right here, it's uh, four point zero five billion was what it sold for, yeah. and man, that was the deal of a century. Because yeah, they ended up making two point zero six eight billion. The film broke various box office records and became unadjusted for inflation, the highest grossing installment in the franchise, the highest grossing film in North America, the highest grossing film of twenty fifteen, and the fourth highest grossing film of all time. I'll go ahead and say this as a. As people like us who are into sort of, you know, awesome this nerd people. culture Probably. stuff, real cool guys, fucking, fucking like buff guys and really sexy and stuff. Yeah, can't the, stop uh, being naked. In the last decade, I'd say the the most happiest I have been personally, and I think that a lot of the nerd community has been um, has been Pokemon Go, <laughs> and this trailer coming out. Le- and the lead up to this movie coming out, because mm-hmm. I think those are I'll like put Endgame up there. Those, too. Oh, oh, sure, yeah, of course. But those, I feel like those are the most hype moments that I have felt. Where mm-hmm. I'll never forget, I was back home uh, for Christmas vacation. I was like, you know, I would always go back home from Austin to the RGB, and I'm like laying in in one of the spare bedrooms that used to be my room, you know, 
and the trailer pops up and, and I'm exhausted, but it's nine in the morning and I cannot go back to sleep. No. And I stay up and I watch the trailer 10 more times and I take it to the living room. I'm like, dad, we got to put this on the Chromecast. Like we got to cast this in, but get the, get the speakers ready. Like, and he had no idea what it even was. He wasn't, didn't even know a trailer was about to come out. Yeah. So he's like, this is a new Star Wars. Like it was just a magical moment. But dude. I mean, it has that one moment. I don't know if it was the first trailer or the second, but I think it was the first one. Where they were like, we're gonna put the best scene of this whole movie in the trailer. The fucking Millennium Falcon going no, upside down it's against just the, thing. the scene where Han Solo and Chewbacca are on the Millennium Falcon. Two. Is that too? And he goes, Chewie, we're, we're home. home. Yeah. Ooh, and I was I like, got chills again. God. Woo-hoo. Yeah. It was so good. The music, the fact that like everything looked and felt like a Star Wars film. You see the Millennium Falcon, you're like, they are hitting it on all levels. Mm-hmm. Like, if only they could come up with a... Com- like They're running up J. the J. score Abrams, right now. You got you got the visuals, you got the actors you want, you got the budget you want, and I'm guessing you have a completely original story that we've never seen before. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get it all. A runtime of two hours and 15 minutes, as always. We're going to avoid future spoilers, which right. I feel now more than ever is going to be the difficult... Uh, this being the turning point, I think, into the more modern movies sure. that we would relate to each other. So let's try our best to avoid okay. future spoilers Try your here. best, Nick. I try my best all the time. Um, before we get into the, the plot, what did we think about Star Wars The Force Awakens? Andy. This is the Star Wars movie I've seen the most. I love it. It's got its issues. <laughs> it is... Uh, this. I think this movie suffers from a lot of, like, convenient things. Mm-hmm. Where just uh, they happen to be in a convenient place. They happen to have the convenient thing they need or whatever. But I love it. I think it's shot beautifully. Again, this is like, this is like if they just reimagined A New Hope, and it's everything I want it to be because it's fantastic acting with great actors with awesome screen presence, um, and it's got some wit to it. You know, it's got the wit that we're used to, where we, you know we loved Han Solo in A New Hope or in the whole trilogy. Uh, having that little like that little cute banter between him and different characters, and that's what they gave us with Poe. Uh, him and Finn, him and Re- like, I just thought all the characters were fantastic. And again, it's shot gorgeously, and it looks it's such it's so pretty to look at, you know. Yeah, I'm with Andy. I mean, going back and watching this with a critical eye, there's definitely some stuff that sticks out as to like, huh, why would that be that way? There's a lot of unanswered questions and a lot of just like, let's let's just give people a solid film. And I think that I think when they set out, they were like, let's just make a good Star Wars film that touches on a lot of nostalgia for fans that and not let's just not fuck it up. And they played it safe in a lot of ways. And it makes it it makes for a fun movie, but it doesn't make for a great movie in my opinion. Like you go back and watch it, you're like, why is there is it why is there a resistance? What's going on with the rebel? What's happening with the Senate? Where where that why is what's going on with all this stuff? And a lot of those questions in typical JJ Abram fashion are set up and they're really fun to think about, but they're not followed through and he leaves all that stuff for the next film, and it's like, good luck with that. I don't even, I don't know. Like, did we figure out where the rebel, like the Republic is? Where's the Senate? What? How did the First Order come about? How did they let the First Order come about when they had this whole galactic Senate? That's a, all these questions. You're, they're like, don't worry about it. That's that's someone else's problem. It reminds right now <laughs> Millennium Falcon, and we're like, fuck that. You know, it like, reminds me of when I worked at when I worked at Best Buy, Nick. Now let me spin you a little tale right here. I worked hmm. at Best Buy, and my the end of my shift was coming, and a customer needed three of their phones transferred over from all these, and I would start. The process, I'd be like, "All right, I'm out. Can you finish the rest yeah. of this? Like, you take care of this issue." You know? um, but I mean, the movie, the movie is so the, the character is what I love most about this. I think he did a great job casting it. I think, like Andy said, it's got wit, it's got charisma. It doesn't have zany humor. There are comedic elements that are comic relief, but they're done so tastefully that it serves to break the tension and then. And then thus allowing us to have more attention later, right? Which is what comic relief is supposed to happen. There are these wonderful moments. I, I think the the thing this film does great. Is that back in the day, Spielberg decided, I'm gonna take a little walk with me. Mm-hmm. Spielberg goes, you know what would be great? Let's make Indiana Jones 4, right? Everyone were on walk together, right? Mm-hmm. And everyone's like, cool, can we get Harrison Ford back? Yeah. Is he gonna nail? Is he gonna feel like Indiana Jones when he does it? No. He's gonna feel like Harrison yeah. Ford dressed as Indiana Jones cosplay, and it's gonna be really weird, and we're gonna get fucking Shia LaBeouf both, and he's gonna come in, and then we got Karen Allen back from the grave, and it's like, What's happening with this film? So when they said that Harrison Ford was going to reprise his role as Han Solo, my biggest worry was I'm like, is it going to feel like Han Solo? And there's a moment where he goes, I'm going to talk my way out of this, like I always do. And Chewie says something inaudible because he's speaking in Wookiee. And he goes, I always have, like he, he just turns to him yeah. and does the Han Solo point thing. And it's like, I fucking nailed it. It is just, it's Han Solo. Yeah. He somehow stepped back into that. 
unlike in the future spoilers when we get to like some of the other characters that come in, they don't necessarily feel like I would want them to feel. He, it just feels like you're watching Han Solo again, and it's so fucking wonderfully done by Harrison Ford. It was such a smart choice. But he's also kind of like an uncle that like yeah. Still, he has that uncle vibe, man. He, he's an uncle, but that that still well, he's an uncle that never got married. Still wears like the skinny jeans and stuff. And oh, it's, it's, that's me actually. Like, <laughs> like he's like that older guy that's still dressing like the young kind of. Keeps kinda, talking about the the punk band he used to be yeah. in New York at a Best Buy. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> I absolutely love this movie. And yeah. uh, again, I agree with you guys. It's not without it, its faults. And I think the biggest fault is how similar it is to a elements of the original trilogy, specifically yeah. A New Hope. I don't see it. But, I, I, <laughs> but, but the thing is, like, I don't think that, that all of those things are bad. I feel like some of those things are totally acceptable. I think that the first half of this movie is as close to perfect of a Star Wars movie as you can be. The second half is where, to me, it starts getting a little bit too convenient, and the Star Killer base stuff is, quite frankly, unnecessary. Yeah, uh, whereas, it really is one of those where I really wish they'd just like set that up and saved that payoff for the second film. And I would have been totally fine, much with better with that. Because uh, they just go, "How are we going to get into this thing?" And the dude from fucking like J.J. Abrams' friend that's always in every fucking movie, uh, Greg, whatever the hell his name is from is Heroes, just, right? yeah, the guy from Heroes, and everything. He's not, he was on. He was in uh, Star Wars or, or Star Trek too. It's just like, what about this oscillator thing? Oh yeah, and the porcupine guy from X Men's like the oscillator. Yeah, it's like, no. In the original trilogy, people fucking died, and then, they made a whole movie about stealing the plans of the Death Star. That's the biggest problem for me. Is like there is a turning point where it's like, oh, there's this this uh, other threat. It's like the Death Star. No, it's actually way bigger than the Death Star. They oh, literally man, show do it. We, do we do we have a, a way to get to, to beat them? Yes, we do. It's the exact same way. Cool. There was never a sense of like fuck. Are they gonna do it? It was just like oh, they got this. They got this handled. Yeah, and, yeah. and I agree with you. They don't set up the like. Why is the first order just back and all this stuff? But having said that, there are elements that are similar that I'm okay with. It being uh, Kylo Ren and Snoke, where it's like oh, it's just Vader and Palpatine again. It's really not. Like I feel like you can you can line things up and be like oh well, in the beginning they they put a, a thing that people need in the droid and then send the droid off. Sure, when you say it like that, mm -hmm. that happened in A New Hope and that happened here, it's very different. And I think that where this movie succeeds is in its characters. And that's what Star Wars is. And in the first half of this movie, immediately, you fall in love with four different new characters. Dude. All of them in the are first so fast. Fantastic. Seven or eight minutes of this movie, you're like, I am in. I am deeply connected with Poe and what's going on with him, what's happening with this droid with BB-8. It's, it's on a level that I don't think I ever got connected to any of the characters. They're also cool. endearing. Like you, They're you, endearing. And you, you care for them. You want to see them succeed so bad. And I think that when it comes to the characters, none of them are just, oh, this is a remake of the originals. I think that you can be like, oh, Poe has elements of Han, but like he's his own person. He nailed know? that character first off. And I, I love it. I think that all of them them nail it. And I think that the, the biggest critique I have character-wise is Rey is fantastic. And I know a lot of people get upset with her just being kind of like able to do anything. And I do think that that was a disservice to her character in that she's a pilot and an engineer and a fighter and the one that has the force. It's just like... She's it's Anakin all over again, but she's Anakin in a way that we actually start to get to know her. I do that. That is, to me, where a lot of the movie starts falling apart at the end, which is why I can't rank it higher than I'm probably going to rank it, is that there are those things where there is like, for a person who has zero money and is trapped on a fucking desert planet and is literally scrounging for scrap to get a piece of bread, how the fuck does she have pilot experience? How does that work? Who's letting her pilot a, a starship? How, you know what I mean? Like, how is that even possible? And then, of course, there's the bigger critique of it, which is at the end, she just kind of figures out how the Force works without anyone ever telling her. Like, she does a Jedi mind trick on someone without even knowing that there is such a thing as a See, Jedi mind I trick. I buy all that stuff because I like I think they, they I set tell her she, like, up. I could red tails. They, they set the... her up as, like, being interested and curious enough about all this stuff and that she is sitting there. She has the little Jedi-like voodoo doll thing. Not Jedi. Um... Starfighter yeah. voodoo doll thing. She has the helmet and she's stuff. She's heard like, about Luke Skywalker. And she's stoked about him. And she's stoked about Han. I, I buy that she knows about all these tales. Right. Um, and because of that kind of knows how to do some of the things because it is just in you. Like the Force is like a weird thing sure. anyways. But and the pilot stuff, like Luke was kind of in that weird same boat too. Luke, but Luke had an interest. Like they set up that he was like, I want to go join the Empire. Like I want to be a pilot. That's what I want to do. My friends are, are going to join Resistance. He had other people that were around him that were going to the academies to learn how to pilot stuff. And so you kind of got that his, his whole shtick was like, I'm a hobbyist when it comes to flying things. But like with Ray, she just goes, I'm a good pilot. And you're like, cool. How do you – like all I've ever seen you do is skid down some, some – uh, like you've repelled. You've used a bobsled. 
and then you've you've used this old broken down speeder. Like I get you're an engineer and a mechanic because you have to be, but the idea of riding a fucking motorcycle and piloting an airplane are two very distinctly different things. Like I have a motorcycle license. Would you trust me to fucking fly you guys in a in a C one thirty? You don't have the force, dude. Oh man, that's not true. This movie's got a lot of like forget everything you know. Yeah. yeah. Like, Absolutely, and, and I think we just kind of have to accept that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, that's how a lot of Star Wars is, you know. But to me, an important thing is though you do right in this. There is a suspension of disbelief where you just go, okay. And it's and like I have these questions, but I'm like, I mean, you can ask questions about every fucking. But here's movie. the thing. Here, but but this one draws you in so much that you just forget about them. Exactly. And that's what the suspension of disbelief is, right? Exactly. You don't sit there midway through and go, "Why is this happening? Why are these characters making these choices?" And thankfully, there's never a Star Wars movie where you do that. So it's, it's not an excuse. Like I, it's, it, I'm not even trying to excuse it, but I do kind of agree with you, Nick. Where when there's a silly sort of thing that happens, in my mind, I go, I like this movie. I don't care. Mm-hmm. Well, like, I, you know, where in past Star Wars movies, right. when those issues do pop up, I'm much more critical because I'm probably not digging my time watching bored the movie. Shitless, right? Yeah, yeah. There, and there's a few things in this that actually there's there's one or two elements in this that did draw me out, and that's why I think it's unfortunate. It is what holds it back from being one of the best Star Wars films ever made. What what are those elements? Because to me, it, I would say it's R two D two. R two D two was the first thing I was going to bring up. Right? Yep. Why? Yeah. Why does he have the other half of the map? Why, why does he turn? You off? know what that question why does he turn is? Turn on? Why does he turn off? Why does he turn on? Why? If you don't want to be found, do you leave a map to where you're going in the first place? Which is a question that's never been answered as far as I know, right? No. Uh, yeah, that whole R2 bit is like one of the worst things about this movie. It's just like, like straight up Barrett, bad, if you bad didn't want to work here time. anymore, yeah. you said I'm going to quit kind of funny forever. Yeah. I never want you guys to talk to me again. But here's a map to exactly where I'll be. <laughs> well, and if you guys need me, just give me a call. Or like, I don't understand the fucking point of this Or whole specifically, thing. like I don't want you guys to ever talk to me again, here's but Andy... Number. I'm still gonna be your roommate. Here's my number. Yeah, that's true. yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and the, feel free to drop by whenever. Yeah. And the other, the other like, thing to tomorrow. me that I think is a real big disservice to this movie is the pacing of reveals. I just think is out of order. Yeah. The us finding out, like Kylo taking his helmet off, Kylo talking or revealing who he is and his mm-hmm. lineage and all that stuff. The dad, all that the, stuff. yeah, Leia and Han's relationship. All of these things, we kind of. I feel should have learned just later in the movie and it should have been hinted at. Whereas I feel like we learn a couple things backwards. One of them being like, oh, Ray, Ray's obviously the force user. Like they when she has the moment where uh Miles Kanata is like, oh, like it's calling to you, whatever. It's like they're straight up telling us, like, you're the user. So later when Ray is like grabs the lightsaber, it's not like a reveal. <laughs> Yeah, I think they they were doing that to sort of like yeah, but I still cry. Because Finn, oh no, for sure, <laughs> Finn using the lightsaber and stuff. I thought I think was a bit of a red herring. Um, but well, it I, doesn't work when the scene before it's clear you know that it's he's not, not him. Be. It's yeah, her. I know, and that's what I'm saying. Is like I feel like the movie could have done a better job of red herring. I will say the one thing that I do love, I do like though, and I'll disagree with you, is that I like the Kylo Ren stuff. We've seen the just generic bad guy for three films, four films, five. We've seen. Just the dark side bad guy. What I like about Kylo in this is that he is conflicted. And so I think putting that element out that he is uh, Anakin Skywalker's grandson, right? Yes, yeah. right? Uh, that he, that he has that lineage, but he's also conflicted about it. I thought it was just really cool. I think that's some of the most fun of the movie where you see this kid who is not an adult, who has this extreme power and and throws literal temper tantrums when he doesn't get what he I wants. Love him. Well, that, I just that's, that's awesome. not disagreeing with me at all. No, no, no but, but I totally like that, they, that. I like that we knew who he was from the get go. I, I like that they didn't. Is, that there wasn't a big reveal of that. He's like, what the big reveal for me was when he calls him Ben, and it was it wasn't a huge. It was not a twist, but it's just the fact that he named his son after Obi Wan Kenobi, which makes absolutely no sense. Why? Why would he do that? Why would Sky was Solo do that? <laughs> Because it's uh, he's paying homage to this guy that like saved his life back in the day. Like he literally like, like he gave his know, life for them so they could get away him from the Death Star. Ben, though, that's another weird. I thing. mean, at some point he was like yeah. Obi Wan, huh? And he goes, "Well, my friends call me Ben. Oh, I'll call you Ben. You name your son after no. after Ben? No, I love breaking Ben. But also remember, like <laughs> <laughs> maybe he didn't name or maybe Leia named it because Obi Wan Kenobi was like the this this thing to her. I don't know. It was Obi Wan though? <laughs> like, hey, Obi. That makes sense. To this was fan service in a way that broke the fourth. Obi wall. sounds yeah. a little dopey. I fucking love it. <laughs> uh, to go back to the map thing, I, I lost them in the chat, but someone made a good point of like, yeah, Luke didn't want to be found. It, it's, it, 
somewhere confirmed, I guess, that uh, that what he didn't leave that map. They had found pieces of a map of where they thought they were going to go. Because remember, Han does say, like... He's going to the Jedi Temple. Like, the first what Jedi we've Temple heard is he's going to the first Jedi Temple. So maybe over, over the course of years, they've been trying to put this map together to, to, try find, to find where that is. So I buy that. I wish... I wish That was set up more than L- I wish yeah. it wasn't a... I wish they would have said that. Yeah. I wish that, that that they were like, we're looking for the first Jedi Temple because we think that's where Luke has gone. Yeah. Like, we think he would have gone there to be in like a monk in hiding in, in a monastery somewhere. Yeah. And that makes more sense. But in this, it, it literally feels like Luke left it so that just in case, like the A-team, if you need help, you can, if you can find us, I'll come help you. But it's like, he didn't do that. Let's and also at the, the end of it, Leia should have been the one to go to Luke. But I get why Ray was. Because you figure if you need your brother's help and you need to talk him out of fucking his solitude random person he's never met or your fucking sister coming and be like get off your shit bro I forgive you for fucking up my son let's go I need your help because he's killing everyone <laughs> you know plot song. you were right about him I don't really have a plot 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 plot, plot. <laughs> it's the plot Nick hey, Andy it's, uh, it's the plot 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 Say the plot a long time ago in a galaxy far far away did the prequel start with that mm-hmm. wow I don't remember them doing that. <laughs> it was so long ago. It's so long ago. Hit uh, me with it, though, Nick. What are those first fucking words? Luke? War. <laughs> War. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, it's the fucking scroll, and Luke has vanished. Luke and Skywalker has, has vanished. vanished. The crawl. What a great first line. Oh, shit. That's not good. Look at all the subtext in that. Oh, we're in danger because he was like the keeper of the peace, right? He's the only Jedi left. What's going on? Anyway, uh, and the sinister First Order has risen from the ashes of the Empire. They want Luke's ass bad because he's the last Jedi. And with him out of the way, they can finally open a Starbucks inside the SFO. Oh, not just outside the SFO. Inside. That's Actually, a big deal. That's great. Yeah. Huge deal. General Leia. Fi- uh, I love that she's General Leia, by the way. Mm-hmm. No, no one... Makes mention as to how she got promoted to General Leia, or why she's General Leia, Goodbye. or why she's not Princess Leia, or Queen Leia. She's just a fucking general because she's a badass leader. That's it. We don't need a throwaway line with that. Uh, wants to find Luke so he can help her and her new resistance, not rebellion. How many times do you think they had to correct people? You're the leader of the rebellion, right? No, 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 no. Yeah, we, that, that, that shit's old school. That's 30 years yeah. ago. This is the resistance. We don't own the trademark to that. It's silly. Yeah. It's super dumb. Uh, help defeat the First Order, uh, which we don't know what that's about, and restore peace and justice and the American way to the galaxy. Leia has sent her most daring pilot on a secret mission to Jakku, where an old ally has discovered the secret to evading the Trade Federation's stiff tax laws on the 1%. Jake, I'm just kidding. They don't have any of that shit. They don't have any of that shit in here. <laughs> you know what I mean? No mention of tax laws or housing trade taxes. embargoes or any of that stuff. What a cool way to just get you hyped for a movie, Hell right? yeah. Uh, and then we get this fucking awesome, awesome opening shot of the Star Destroyer silhouetted over a planet, which I assume was Jakku, but I, I don't know why, because it looks blue and Jakku looks super orange. doesn't matter. Um, uh, transport ships launch from it uh, and head to the surface. On board, new Star Stormtroopers, and their armor is looking dope as Yes, fuck. it fucking is. There, you finally get the sense of, like, th- that these are real people, you know, especially after watching three movies of CG clone troopers it's like seeing them with the lights like going crazy and you see the stormtroopers like oh this is war like this is actually a star war yeah which is awesome Uh, a little fact for the for everyone though the first original draft that jj wrote started with and the story went a different direction so they they didn't do this but the opening shot was going to be the luke skywalker's um uh hand holding the lightsaber (laughs) but as a fell from bespin oh interesting (laughs) yeah Hmm. i wonder if he'll ever cover how she got that thing back Miles Kanata, that's a story for another time. Yeah. You know what? I buy it. <laughs> I buy it. Uh, on the surface, we're introduced to BB-8, cutest droid on the planet, who rolls over to find his master, Poe Dameron, who is being handed a clue to Luke's whereabouts by Lore Santeca, played wonderfully by uh, old school actor Max von Sydow. And what does he say? What is the first line of this fucking movie? This will begin to make things right. Oh, yeah, it will. Don't be so sure about that, Max. Uh, also, <laughs> we got a long really, road to episode nine. Really quick, shout out to Max von Sydow because he was the villain in um, Flash Gordon, correct? Uh, probably. Yeah, and uh, it's like I, a kind of like full circle of. I just remember him from the from Judge Dredd. 
Oh. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, so, oh I, see, I see what you're getting at. Sorry. Yeah, it's, finish it's, that sentence. My apologies. Uh, I believe that's him. Um, I could be wrong. Chat, let me know. You mean Flash Gordon, which is what Lucas wanted to rank, make originally. Yeah, couldn't but get the then couldn't, to, so he made yeah. Star Wars. So That's awesome. Uh, BB-8 busts in to warn them of incoming stormtroopers, and Lore tells Poe to leave. The stormtroopers drop with the motherfucking thunder, and everything looks so real. Wow, the fully computer-generated environment of stormtroopers really have come a long way. What? What's that? They were real humans in real costumes? <laughs> Get the fuck How out of here. How much did those suits cost? Get no way. The budget no on those way. suits must have been crazy. No way. What are you going to tell me next? That uh, both Batman and Superman's mom's name, Martha, and I didn't fucking notice that for 30 fucking seven years? <laughs> 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 Poe attempts to take off, but his ship is damaged by blasters. And holy shit, someone brought a fucking flamethrower. This scene is fucked up. <laughs> yeah, I feel bad for all of the the sort of citizens of this little. Well, uh, I just want, I want to take a second here, right? Is that one alien who's getting pulled? He's like, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so like, so obviously, so the, we talked about the prequels being more focused toward kids. This one is not. This is a movie that is made for, I would say, all ages, but for the most part, predominantly Star Wars fans that are probably in their 20s and 30s. Because this is a horrifying scene. They are pulling people out of their of their tents and shit, and someone's fucking flamethrowing. And it is just like, it's like they looked at old footage of Nazis and were like, how, and World War II, and were like, how do we make, how do we recreate yeah. this in, on, in space? I mean, it's not like they had blood or anything, though. Oh. Oh, wait. Yeah, they fucking did. And it's the most stri- Yeah. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, yeah, you're right. That's fine. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, Poe attempts to take off, but his ship is damaged. Uh, let's see. BB-8, it gives BB-8 the thumbstick that Lord gave him and tells him to keep it safe and orders him to get as far away as possible. Don't open my porn folder, please. <laughs> uh, yeah, and also... Or open it if you want. <laughs> well, also, if I die, go to my computer Good and just, don't, just burn it. Yeah. Never open anything on my computer. Uh, we see, of course, FM-2187. Uh, we'll just call him Finn from now on because that's too hard to say. Uh, sees one of his fellow stormtroopers get got... And has a moment we've literally never seen a stormtrooper have before. Instead of blindly following uh, his fellow troops into battle with little g- regard for anything, he seems traumatized by the carnage of war. This experience leaves a phys- literal physical mark on him in the form of his friend's bloody handprint uh, that we can assume is a sim- a symbolic for the emotional mark left on him as well. In this movie, we're getting visual storytelling. We're getting subtext. We're getting images that tell us something that characters are like, hey, that thing on your head? You know what that means? I'll explain it to you. And everyone, we don't need that. We're not dumb. It's fucked up. We get it. Moving on. The scene I do, is dark. I do like to imagine there's got to be some other stormtroopers out there that are like kind of feeling similarly. Like, fuck, I could have had my own movie had I just like had I just spoken about my feelings. <laughs> like, they it's like reality show. I would have been the star of this. You're shit. Like, if I just let Ray J bang me on camera, <laughs> I could have my whole reality show empire. <laughs> well, that's what's gonna happen. Weird uh, analogy. Then Kylo lands and takes this shit up a notch. I love his costume. I love his ship design. I love his ship he, design. I, I will love say this about right it. now, Tim. Go Tim for Gettys, it. Tim I'll say this yes. right now. This is the best ship design of all of this current okay, trilogy. Okay, I thought you were gonna say in general. Of no, any. but like when okay. this thing, when this fucker pops up on screen, I'm like, how much is that goddamn Lego set? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's three hundred dollars. Fuck, Nick. <laughs> did you see the Batmobile Lego set today? No. Oh, bear, can dope. you find it, please? Yeah. Uh, what I love about this, though, by the way, is he walks in and he start when he starts talking, you hear the voice, and it's so perfect because it's scary. And it's cool looking, but it also in the back of your brain, you're like, that's kind of a cheap knockoff yep. of Vader. I fucking love it. And it's it. so well done. But it also just sounds badass. It sounds cool. I love the effect. But Whatever it sounds he's talking, like, I'm like, it this sounds, sounds like dope. you're a fucking wannabe. poser. You're yeah, a you're a wannabe. wannabe. It's hot topic uh, as hell. Kylo wants to locate Star uh, Skywalker, but Lore basically calls him a bitch and tells him he can't deny the truth about his. Oh, that's fucking sick. That is sick. Uh, sorry, we're looking there at, there it go. is right there. We're looking at the Batmobile. <laughs> the 89 Batmobile, yeah. that's beautiful. Uh, tells me, cannot deny the truth about his family. Then Kyle, and Kylo says, you know what? You're right. And cuts his ass down like Grandpappy Anakin did to those useless younglings back on Coruscant. I felt so bad, though, because like Max von Sydow is like such a great actor. I would have loved for him to be sort of a main character in this whole trilogy. That would have been cool. He's but just, that's so great. That's what I love about this, though. They're like, we're going to put this one element in there, and we're going to leave you wanting more. That's uh, nice. Uh, let's see. Uh, Poe freaks out and shoots at Kylo, who stops the bolt of laser midair. What? So cool. And the sound effect is so <laughs> badass. <laughs> and, and, and then Poe's like, uh, Poe's looking at it like, what the what fuck? What the fuck? So rad. They bring Poe over to Kylo, who figures that Lore gave him the thumbstick. And there's this great moment here that I love. And it's so... It was a risk, by the way, because it could have gone either way, and it could have play- been played out horribly. But he sit- they sit him down, and they kneel him in front of him, and Kylo leans down and looks at him, and there's a beat, and he goes, 
Who talks first? Do you talk first or I talk first? I don't know. Like, fuck you. I don't care. Yeah. Kill me, motherfucker. I'm the I'm a resistance fighter and I will not bow down to you. Like, I don't give a shit. Isaac improvised a number of his lines as Dameron, including the Who Talks First exchange with Ren. Mm. I wonder what the actual line is. Like, did somebody just forget their line or what? I just think he did it in one take and, it, and like, like it, JJ's yeah, like, that that's works. cool, we'll leave that. Because it's perfect Poe. Yeah. It sets his character up immediately. You know what he's going to be from that moment. I you agree know with he, you, though, Nick, though, is that that was a risk. Because so early on, having a comedic element like that, it could have been like, uh, but what but I, it's not, though. It really works. What I like about it, though, is that he. it's because uh, uh, Oscar Isaac is such a good actor, and you see the fear in his face before this, you know that when he's saying that, it's just, it's just masking the fear. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. just him f- fakely being brave in front of this thing that's horrifying. He knows he's dead. But he's like, I'm going to fuck with this guy a little bit because that's – I'm going to muster the courage I have to. It's so well done. He was like, I can't hear what you're saying through the apparatus. Yeah. <laughs> like, I love that line. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Poe freaks out, yada, yada, yada. And they bring him aboard. Then uh, Kylo orders Phasma to kill all the villagers. But Finn can't bring himself to do it, which Kylo recognizes. He lets the blast – and then he lets the blaster bo- bolt go. As he as he walks, he lets it go free and it blasts right next to Finn. And Finn's and like freaking like, the Jesus, fuck out. what the hell's going also, on? Also, though, they're just like, hey, man, uh, so the Stormtrooper designs are the rat things ever yeah uh, the scout trooper designs those are even cooler oh we need to we need to one up that let's just connect the black on the stormtrooper helmets fuck that looks cool hey uh we need a leader of like the general of the stormtroopers we need them to look even fucking cooler oh uh, what if they just were all like a mirror yeah what if she was <laughs> Holy chrome shit she looks awesome she looks yeah. awesome I, I read a piece of trivia when i was watching this that said so like according to some comic or whatever and probably not canon that her armor was done uh was made from the melted parts of a naboo ship Fuck yeah. Which I was like, I'll buy that. Hell that sounds yeah. Oh, maybe like the queen ship. Yeah. yeah. Like uh, she has that, that mirror ship. I I do want to know what the meetings look like in the industrial design like department where they're talking about these helmet redesigns and stuff. Because like, I would love to be a part of that. Well, you know, you, you know what else was an interesting touch was that they were like, even the blasters have white on them this time. Yeah. So they aren't all black blasters. They have that carried through. Everything to me is so well done in this. It's like it's smoother. It's simpler. It's more streamlined. It's like the difference between like an iPhone it's Johnny uh, I. You know, the iPhone 11 and then, and, uh, fuck, I'm, I'm missing it. The iPhone 8, kick. right? Where it's like, it's, it's so well done. But it's just, it's subtle. Like, if you blink, you're like, what, where's that armor from? And it's cool. I like yeah. it a lot. Uh, of course, up, uh, up on the Star Destroyer, they carry Poe to the prison block as Finn has a fucking literal panic attack. He rips his helmet off, but Phasma tells him to, uh, to put it back on and basically go check his blaster. She's calling him out for, for not firing on the villagers she says put your helmet back on uh and he does so and as he puts his helmet on we cut over to uh Jakku, where ray pulls the curtain aside and i love this edit so much why it's, do you love it Nick? because it's good visual storytelling yes right well, how so uh because it, it's so crazy to see how well uh cg curtain technology has come <laughs> around wait i'm sorry what <laughs> that curtain was real the <laughs> cuts in this movie the cut I, I think throughout are so good because anytime they use a star wars wipe it's right. to evoke star wars nostalgia right. but anytime they just do the hard cuts it's always with a decision to make you feel a certain way about the scenes and i love this because we, we've just been introduced to all these characters good bad and ambiguous yeah. and then we see this character in this dark grimy thing that looks like a bad guy yeah. When she first goes, but then the music starts playing and like she like theme. takes the thing yeah. off and you're like, Oh, you're good. But I just I love that the design with her stuff, it's like she looks like she's a Tuscan Raider. She does. Well, aren't those but, eyes from a stormtrooper helmet or something like that? Like I I could have sworn that the the mask she uses goggles. I thought the goggles were like taken from other parts or some shit like that. I, ju- I, I just, just love, like this because I think cool. storyboard wise, it's so it's very symbolic of where the character's emotional states are, right? He has to put the helmet that he hates back on. Thus, giving you a sense of like, of oh, this guy's in a situation that he does not want to be. I'm stuck in Forced to be in there, and then the very next thing is we see the other character that we're about to fall in love with open something up, shed light on something. So it's so well done, man. You know, and like, and you go back and think, can you point to anything in the prequels that has that level of visual storytelling? I can't because no, the importance wasn't put on the editing or the cinematography or the acting or any of that. It was just simply put on the effects. And it's Roger, sad. Roger. Roger, Roger. Uh, uh, let's see, down on Jakku, really cool. Uh, let's see, uh, Ray, uh, of course, is scavenging for parts in the remnants of a crashed Star Destroyer. And the visuals here are so fucking <laughs> cool. They just take a, like they knew this was gonna be awesome. And they knew that seeing this in the big screen, it was gonna be so powerful. And they give you that. They take a moment and they go, we're just gonna see her in this environment as she's rappelling down. And then they have this beautiful shot where it's the little Ray, 
Right? Remember when we talked about uh, Return of the Jedi, where C three PO and R two D two are standing in front of this hulkingly uh, like giant, Palace. almost Im- imperceivably big, challenging wall. She's doing the same thing. She's standing in the middle of this giant blast uh, uh, jet engine thing, mm-hmm. right? The the remnants of it, and it's just seemingly insurmountable. This task that's in front of her. It's such a. That's what I love about it. It's also just such an an easy win. Like you got to imagine them sitting at the content detail of being like, put her inside of a star destroyer and just watch how people freak and, but, out but at the imagery. On top of that, though, it's just like you see it in your head immediately. All it takes is someone to say that, and you're just like, oh, that works. It's going to be and cool. that's awesome. And it's it's not. It, no one chalks it up to well, that's convenient. No, no, no. You know, no it's no, like no. that's good nostalgia. Yeah, yeah. But it's not even that. It's it's that it's it's good storytelling, right? You have this character that's that's lost. She's on this desolate planet, and what does she do? She her only recourse for survival is scavenging the old remnants of the thing in the past that we knew. God. It's so well done. And that one shot is so beautiful. Shout out to Dan, uh, I wrote his name, uh, Dan Mandel, who is a cinematographer that worked with J.J. Abrams on pretty much all of his movies. He did 2009 uh, Star Trek as well. He just knows. He just has good shots, Pretty man. good at his job. Pretty good at his job. Uh, Ray, of course, then sleds down a sand dune, which looks really, really fun. I kind of want to do that. And uh, packs her shit up onto an old speeder, which I want one of these so bad. It's like a cool vintage speeder that you're like, oh, that like a hipster speeder. <laughs> like when, when people in San Francisco ride the Honda CBs, like the old ones, you're like, it's pretty cool, man. It's rusted pack. Tina, I love it. Uh, Ray heads back <laughs> to a little trading outpost. And she, but as she go, we get the like establishing shot kind of of where she's at, and Jakku is just flat, desolate. Des- but you see the Star Destroyer just kind of coming out of the ground, and you see an X-wing kind of buried. What a great as shot. she's going across this giant landscape. I fucking love it, and the whole time. Her themes playing. Mm-hmm. I talk so often about scores. Obviously, John Williams amazing. And the best thing about the prequels is the music because they are tonally uh, kind of symbolic of everything, and they 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 do have a consistency of quality mm-hmm. and of storytelling just within them. We get introduced to Ray's theme in this, and I love that. Here we are four years later after this movie yeah. has come out, and when they play the epic version in trailers and stuff, it hits us. Like we care about Ray because this theme, this little do 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 do, it's, it's just it, like it's it's fun. It, it's whimsical. Yeah. It's hey, we're about to go on an adventure, similar to Leia's theme, which. Spoilers, we'll hear in about a half hour, yeah. 45 minutes, which which makes you think of love and mm-hmm. family and like loyalty and all these so, things. So, so good. So a couple, well a couple facts here. Uh, this is the first J.J. Abrams film not to have a musical score by by Michael uh, Giacchino. Giacchino. I, I could never say his last name. Giacchino. Giacchino. Yeah. I don't yeah, there know. You go. Aptly enough, uh, he stated in an interview that he would Giacchino? rather hear the music of John Williams in a new Star Wars film than his own. Uh, his name shows up in Episode Seven's credits as a stormtrooper. <laughs> That's awesome. It's really cool. And then the other one, uh, John Boyega was so nervous and frightened at the prospect of not getting the role that he didn't tell his parents that he'd been cast until a cast photo was posted online by the official Star Wars page. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I will say that this whole this whole new trilogy is basically every frame of painting. Like, God, yes. yes. You know, wh- whether you didn't like Last Jedi or not, I, th- I get this movie, that movie, and we can already tell from the trailers that uh, The Rise of Skywalker, every shot is just so oh, like perfectly stunning. crafted. I, I will say, that, to show a shout out to The Last Jedi, there are some of the most beautiful imagery in Star Wars in that movie. Yeah. It's gorgeous. They, they like... We'll talk about it next week. We'll talk about it next week. Uh, but Two no, weeks, but yes. there's but there's so many beautiful things in, in this whole series, and it's a lot of it is shout out to Dan Mandel and the fact that they did all this stuff practically, uh, most of it practically. Anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, Ray heads back and starts cleaning some of uh, her the scraps she brought back, and we get this one beautiful little shot. They didn't need to put this in there, but this is why I like this. This makes it a real movie to me. Is she's cleaning it and she looks over and she sees an older woman, a much much older oh, woman, yeah. looking. And cleaning the same, and she locks eyes with her for a second, and that woman's doing the same thing she's doing. Yep. And it's not nobody calls uh, calls attention to it. It is just nice subtext of if she doesn't get off this planet, that is what she'll That's turn into. She didn't be. need to walk over and be like, "I used to be just I like you, be just like, like you." Yeah. Like, it's just no. so <laughs> it's subtle. It's one and quick thing. We get you it. Fucking get it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We move on. We don't need to. Then you also see the on. ship flying off. That's uh, that's a bit oh. later. Oh, but yeah. Um, uh, so, and then she goes over to Simon Pegg, which is awesome, uh, and <laughs> gives uh, who gives her one quarter portion for her parts, and she heads off defeated. She's like a little pissed off at him. When she gets home, and we don't see what she's living in yet, she makes the bread, which I have no idea how they did the shot, but it's so cool, and I want so that bread. I actually have that. Oh. Uh, give me one. Look at this. One. Look at it's this. So cool. It's uh, such a cool. The shot. crusty piece of instant bread Ray throws together on Jakku by emptying a small sachet of powder into some liquid in a small bowl was not CGI. The practical effect was achieved by inflating a bread molded bladder with air. While 
while simultaneously sucking the water from the bowl with a hidden tube. Yeah, you could see the water like come down. That's it's what so I cool. Immediately. It's it's pretty awesome. And also, shout out to the Simon Pegg's character. The like, I forget, I didn't write his character's well, name. Yeah, I just whatever, him whatever his Pegg. name is. But I I love it because I feel like it was a very bold choice that they made on purpose to have him be a CG character because they're just like, look, we can make this work too. Like, oh, I didn't realize he was CG. I yeah, he was he, there, the mouth was there, CG. No, there's uh, there's shots of him in a costume. Yeah, the, on, the like, mouth the you can tell is animated, but yeah. like the face though. Yeah, yeah, but it's like it's I like combination. I feel like there's there, that was a choice to hey early on. It's like we're gonna because there's the alien as well that was getting pulled by the stormtroopers where they're like we're not afraid of CG. Right, we're just gonna be we're gonna use it she's in a, choice time yeah, smartly. Uh, and then of course she eats dinner while outside she's watching the ship take off in the distance, which I like uh, another piece of uh, of symbolism and foreshadowing. Uh, and then uh, as we pull back, we see where she's living, which is fucking awesome because she's taking refuge in the belly. Of a, of a hollowed out old uh, ATST walker, which is really really cool, or AT 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 walker. Um, so fucking tight. Then she hears a ruckus that gets her attention and looks over the sand dune and sees BB-8 has found his way into the net of Tito. Uh, and then she has some harsh words that she shares with Tito, and Tito lets him go. Uh, Ray points BB-8 toward the town and tells him uh, basically just uh, you got you're on your own. But the droid is just too g darn cute. And she's like, fine, you can stay with me for the night, and then I'll take you in there later. He's like, I'm on a secret mission. And she's like, you should not tell people that. If you're on a secret mission, don't tell. He's like, Luke Skywalker. Ah! I don't and she's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you trying to get me killed, motherfucker? Yeah. Less than I know is better. BB-8 is pure magic. He's so fucking cute in yeah. this. And the animation with him, like, there's a there's a moment on the Millennium Falcon with the back and forth where he, like, looks over and he's, yep. like, trying to figure out what's going on. It's so well done. It's so, so expressive. So, so good. Uh, up in the Star Destroyer, Poe po is getting tortured. Uh, and we also, I love the little touch they have the torture droid there from A New Hope. It's like, yeah. Uh, but, of course, uh, Poe is just too damn tough and that the droid is not getting it done. So Kylo comes in uh, to use the force on him. And he's a uh, he's a bad boy, and he wants Poe to know it. So he uses a force to make Poe scream and uh, draw out where uh, the plans for Skywalker are, which uh, we we learn are on the planet in the BB-8 droid. Uh, let's see. Uh, Poe gives up BB-8, and Kylo orders General Hux to send some fools down to go get it. Uh, and that's oh, and that's what Bill's been up to after he defeated yeah. Baltimore. And I was like, where have you been, Bill? <laughs> How are the dragons doing? Uh, down on Jakku. What do you think happened to what's her face? Fleur. Yeah, I think she's back home hanging yeah. out, man. Hanging she, out? I mean, she's probably like, doing her thing. I mean, I like to believe she thinks she's a teacher now. <laughs> Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I thought like I was to out of third she grade. Thinks she's a teacher now. <laughs> I like to think she's a teacher. <laughs> okay, okay. I thought that? I was out of the Harry Potter thing, but you brought me back in. Charlie is the one with dragons. Bill is the one who works for Gringotts. So ah, I'm thank sorry. you. I'm I sorry. apologize. I That's okay. I expected you to, to. I just wrote that down. At first, I wrote Bill's dead, and then I was like, "Did Bill die?" And then I looked it up, and I'm like, "Bill didn't die. <laughs> <laughs> Bill's still alive." <laughs> I think I looked that one up, or otherwise people in the chat would have. Been, oh, oh, what the oh, fuck is going whoa. on? Oh God! I don't. I don't. Know I don't know. Happening. Who is this? Yeah. Terrible. This will begin to set it right, eh? Because I wear granddad's mask. Good movie, not good movie. He's good. Oh, <laughs> There's only three mics to go around. Yeah. Oh, Tim, look in your eye. You know it to be true. The characterization of the prequel. Small, <laughs> Annie. Little bit bigger, Annie. Yeah, yeah. Long head, Annie. That's a movie. <laughs> That is real. Oh, I can do it all. Oh, I fly this ship real good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, where the hell be real good? So oh, then you go, Kylo Ren. Oh, oh granddad. Oh, oh, granddad. Oh, it's not the... Hey, prequel. Very good universe. <laughs> Underrated universe. We built it all. We built it all! Why do you have the Vader mask, Wado? I'll show you how dumb Kylo Ren is. They are. Oh, granddaddy. Oh, I'm so sorry. I wasn't there for you. Hey. Thanks, Wado. And then there's some uh, sunglasses under Wado's oh, face. Yes! Are you mad at me? So, so the purple oh, sunglasses. So yeah, that yeah. makes sense. <laughs> Anyway. Uh, anyway. <laughs> thank, thank you, Otto. The characterization of the prequels. Yeah, the characterization of the prequels. Of the prequels. Uh, Nick, before we get on with the plot, sure. let me tell you about our sponsors. <laughs> This episode of Kind of Funny in Reviews brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-belt grooming. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your 
family jewels. Manscaped is forever changing the grooming game with their Perfect Package 2.0. They're just out here trying to help us keep our balls clean, Andy. Keep our balls looking nice. Keep everything about our balls on the tip top pristine condition that they can be. I love it. You know what I'm talking I love about? It, yeah, what yeah. do you love about it? I love the the, the wipes. Mm-hmm. You know, you have a long day, sometimes you just feel gross down there, you mm-hmm. know? Or gross everywhere else. Yeah. In my in my you know, I'm an oily dude. I'm mm-hmm. gross. Yeah. Take those ball wipes. Do a little ball wipe it. Wipe it up, and dude. Then also, and then just wipe everywhere else, but yeah. with different ball wipes. Yeah. The Perfect Package 2.0 also includes anti-chafing performance boxer briefs that keep your package cool and smelling fresh all day. It's fantastic. They really are thinking of everything here. Uh, you're talking about not using the same ones twice. That's a good a good call. It's almost as good of a call as not using the same razor to shave your face as you do to shave your balls. They're thinking about everything here, man. Uh, let's not forget about the Crop Preserver, an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer. You already put deodorant on your armpits. Why aren't you putting deodorant on your balls uh get 20 percent off plus free shipping with the code morning at manscaped.com always use the right tools for the job your balls will thank you get 20 percent off and free shipping with the code morning at manscaped.com that's 20 percent off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code morning impressive also shout out to me undies you know i'm wearing them right now i wear them every day and it makes my life a lot better for it. Nick just got his first pair. He had a little Day of the Dead action going on. Andy Cortez here with some dinosaurs. Wow. Did I, t- did wow. I, t- I mentioned this on, on a KFAF, but I um, the other day when we were doing an interview, I, w- I actually used our promo code and bought three pairs. Fantastic. Yeah. 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 Your life's about to be three times better I'm now. I'm really three excited days about Because now, now I'll have, I think, like... Six now. Yeah, I'm getting, which is almost yeah. that's enough to be able to We're cycle close, correctly, baby. man. Yeah. yeah, I got the MeUndies shirt. I'm always wearing. Gotta love that collection. They're so soft. Wherever mm-hmm. it is, wherever you're putting MeUndies on, me undies on your body, whether it's your undies, your shirt, your socks, your onesies, they got a little something for everybody. They got all these fun prints. Christmas is coming up. Joey's really stoked about their their Christmas collection. Uh, MeUndies has a great offer for you guys. For any first time purchasers, you get 15 percent off and free shipping. Uh, you can get your 15 percent off, free shipping, and 100 percent satisfaction guarantee by going to MeUndies.com/morning. That's MeUndies.com/slash morning. Uh, And finally, shout out to Upstart. As most of us have found out the hard way, getting into debt is easy. Getting out is hard, especially if your credit score isn't great. Thankfully, now there's Upstart.com, the revolutionary lending platform that knows that you're more than just your credit score and offers smarter interest rates to help you pay off your high interest credit card debt. Uh, This could have helped Greg back when he was just the the size of a pumpkin. Just this small, small boy uh, making his journey over to San Francisco and he made some really bad choices with his credit and this could have helped. Upstart goes beyond the traditional credit score when assessing your credit worthiness. They actually reward you based on your education and job history in the form of a smarter interest rate. They believe you're more than just your credit score. They believe in you. They make it fast, simple, and easy to check your rate in just a few minutes. What great guys. Uh, The best part, once the loan's approved and accepted, most people get their funds the very next business day. You can see why Upstart's ranked number one in their category with over 300 businesses on Trustpilot. And hurry to upstart.com slash morning to find out how low your Upstart rate is. Checking your rate only takes a few minutes and won't affect your credit. That's upstart.com slash morning. Nick, that's the plot. Motion. Back down on Jakku. Uh, Ray tells BB-8 not to give up hope to find his friend uh, that he will find his friend so he can carry out his secret mission. Uh, she knows all about waiting. She's been waiting for her family to come back for a real long time. That's really sad. Uh, Simon Pegg wants to give Ray uh, hell of portions for BB-8, but Ray is like, you know what? Yeah, I'll do it. And then thinks better of it. Actually, the droid's not for sale. And I love this because... Uh, it's really, really indicative of who Ray is, right? She's on this. She's on this desolate planet, but there's some part of her that, no matter how hard things get, she still has morals and she's still a good person, and that's very, very Jedi of her, which I like. Uh, it's too very bad. Gryffindor of her, you know. He's super Gryffindor. Mm-hmm. Kind of like Ravenclaw, Kevin, Kind of yeah. Ravenclaw, yeah. So, kinda, uh, too bad no one else has morals because Simon Pegg's like, cool. If you don't want to, if I'm not going to be able to buy this thing from you, I'm just going to take it from you. Orders a bunch of his goons to go take it from her. Uh, up in space. Uh, Finn springs Poe and offers him a deal. I'll help you escape if you fly me out of here in a TIE fighter. And he goes, why are you helping me? And then Finn goes, because it's the right thing to do. And then there's a beat. And then he goes, you need a pilot, don't you? He's like, I need a pilot. I yeah. Need a pilot. I'm going to try it. And I love so that. Great. And he, then he goes like this. We're going to do this. Yeah. <laughs> it's so and fucking it's, good. It's right after that We're moment do this that I'm like watching this in my, you know, it's late last night. I'm tired as shit. But 
it, that little line of dialogue, that back and forth, I just go, God, I fucking love this movie. Yeah, like, I love these characters yeah. so totally. much. It's, it's real. They feel like they're three-dimensional yeah. characters. Which I, they sneak into a TIE fighter, and Poe gives uh, Finn a crash course on working the blasters. Uh, they try to lift off, but the fuel tether stops them from leaving. Uh, Finn uses his blasters to kill pretty much all of his old friends, and off they go. Uh, out in space, they rip shit up as they escape, taking out the turbo lasers. Love seeing the old red targeting system, by the way, on the, on the screens. Uh, it's just really, really cool. Uh, uh, Poe asks, let's see, oh, Poe asks him, asks him his name, and Finn replies, FN2187. He's like, I'm not calling you that. I'm going to call you Finn. Uh, and then since we, you were alone when I met you, I'll call you Finn Solo. <laughs> <laughs> Future Finn spoilers. Alone. <laughs> Finn by yourself. Up in the bridge, Kylo catches wind of what's going right, on. Real quick, bef- before we move on, yeah. I just, again, a, more of a back and forth of like, uh, what's your name? My name is Poe. And he's like, oh, I'm going to call you Finn. Uh, Finn, I like that. Great to meet you, Poe. Great to meet you too, Finn. Like, I just, they're so badass yeah. together. It's fun. I want more of this. I, I love the sexual chemistry too. Yeah. Dude. So Dude, it's but I love the sexual chemistry seriously across the board of all the characters. Like I love that there's no romance plot in this movie, but you kind of feel that any which way it could kind fuck. of work. They're all of them. Ray at the point, you if know? there was a little bit of that blue fucking fuzzy tauntaun or whatever you guys had at Galaxy's Edge, yeah. everyone would just get down. It like, would just be like a fucking orgy. Ray's gonna be skiing, you know what a, I mean? Yeah. A sexless, all sex orgy. You know what I mean? <laughs> you lost me. Nah, I lost bodies myself. rubbing, ro- like rolling over each other. I mean, undefined. No, inter- no intercourse. Let's, just, uh, yeah. let's let's move on. Uh, up in the bridge, Kylo catches one of what's going on. Poe has escaped with the help of one of the others, and uh, Kylo knows the trooper's name before Hux can say it. It was the one from the village, FN two one eight seven. I like that part where he's like, it's FN he knew 20. it. He just knows it. Uh, they fire some ventral cannons at the Tie Fighters, which are super hard to dodge. Finn takes out the first one. Poe tells them they're going to go back to Jakku to get BB eight, a white and orange droid. A lot of exposition here, which is odd. I'm like, you're saying a lot of things that you shouldn't say. Oh, right, he has to know what the droid looks like uh, so he can play the part. Uh, Poe tells him they're going back because it's got a map straight to Luke Skywalker and then Finn radios back to Kylo and says, he fell for it. Let's get him. No. Why would you tell him? You just met this guy who was a stormtrooper. Why would you tell him that you have a map to Skywalker? It doesn't matter. Uh, they fire some metro. Anyway, uh, the missile hits them and they crash on the surface. Uh, no, Finn- but before then, though, I, there's more back and forth where I love the like he starts shooting people he's like I got him he's yeah. like yeah you did let's yeah. go <laughs> yeah it's good he's like super uh, super uh, yeah anyway when, the, when, the, him, when yeah. the ship first takes off though there is that cool mode he's like Woo, this baby can fly. I forgot what the line that Poe said. Well, he goes, I've always moves. wanted to fly one of yeah, these things. Baby and then he goes, this baby yeah. can move. And it looks like it. Like, these fucking TIE fighters are so fast. Uh, well, I've been working on an impression go for of it. the TIE fighters. <clears throat> that's terrible. That was, that's worse than your Snape impression. No, I didn't Lord. hate it, but I, I didn't love it either. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, have, you have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> The ion engines. I watched it with okay, subtitles, that, that and it just bad. said that was the bad. roar of the ion engines, and I was like, that's fucking cool. Uh, anyway, Mitchell has them. They crash land. Uh, Poe, uh, excuse me, Finn is thrown from the ship when he rushes back over to find Poe in the wreckage. It sinks into the sand and then explodes, and all that's left is Poe's jacket, which is cool. Uh, we get a great shot of Finn uh, as he's walking toward town, shedding his stormtrooper armor uh, as he heads toward, toward town. And then he uses Poe's jacket to shield himself from the heat of the burning sun, which I think is really, really cool. Another piece of like foreshadowing and visual storytelling where it's, it's not really you know explicitly told, but he's taking that, that vestige of the resistance and, like, protection. and it's protecting him. So- which is cool, unlike the armor, which is weighing him down. Uh, great. Uh, let's see. Up on the bridge, Hux. Has thrown away, uh, has a throwaway line introducing Supreme Leader Snoke, and then they argue because Hux hates Kylo and Kylo hates Hux. Just make it out, just fucking make out already. You know what I mean? Uh, his men are exceptionally trained, programmed from birth. They make reference to the clone army as well because why not? Uh, we needed to know that these aren't clones. These are actually people who were just trained and taken from their families. Uh, Finn gets to town and drinks from a giant dog bowl as Ray uh, is getting roughed up by some of Simon Pegg's men. So uh, be a practical alien. That's the thing. Practical alien, man. After crash landing on Jakku, Finn attempts to drink some of the putrid water from a... Uh, a tr- how do you say that word? Trough? Trough. Trough. Uh, belonging to a big, ungainly pig-like creature. The beast is called a hapabore, and it was a practical puppet that required five puppeteers to operate. It's perfect. 
And I love the scene. Uh, knocks the shit out of him. <laughs> uh, as Ray's getting roughed up, Finn rushes over to help, but it turns out there's no Reed. Ray can take care of herself. Uh, he spots BB-8, the droid Poi was talking about, uh, and then BB-8 sees him and realizes that he's wearing uh, his jacket, and Ray chases after, chases his ass down. Uh, and then when they get together, uh, Finn tells them that he helped Poe escape, but he didn't make it. Uh, Ray asks him if he's still if he's with the Resistance, and Finn's like, yep, I am, I am with the Resistance. Uh, and he tells Ray that BB-8 has the map to Luke Skywalker and everyone hears. It's like, dude, quiet the fuck down. Stop just yelling Luke Skywalker everywhere. It's not going to get you any, anywhere on this planet. I love every single piece of dialogue and every single look given in this entire sequence because we, we've just been introduced to all these characters that we now fucking love. Finn, Ray, Poe, BB-8, all of these characters we immediately care about. And when BB-8 looks up at Ray, like sees Finn, looks at Ray, does whatever he does, Ray looks over at, at Finn and gives that look of like, I'm about to fuck you up, and like starts chasing him down. I'm so in where I'm like, I want you to catch him, but I also don't want you to get caught. Yeah. It's like you care about every angle of it. It's so cool. Uh, of course, then they're spotted by stormtroopers, and a <clears throat> foot chase ensues. The troopers call in an airstrike uh, while Finn roots for some weapons. We hear the unmistakable roar of TIE fighters approaching overhead, and I fucking love the sound cue because he's just look he's rummaging through the stuff he's like there's gotta be a blast around here somewhere and then you just hear it <sighs> like off in the distance it's just that that fucking cry <laughs> that shriek of those ion engines is coming close and he knows exactly what's gonna happen he's like we gotta get the fuck out of here right now and he grabs ray's hand and she's like wait what are you doing don't, don't grab my hand and he's like we gotta go but also i want to hold your hand you know a little bit of forget what you know right here you know the tie fighters are capable of hovering and shooting but they're doing the let's do a pass through shoot 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 let's fly all yeah, it's more the way fun around way. do another pass through and it's like later on we see the tie fighters just kind of like floating in some scenes and and then they will fly away but yeah. they're, they're capable of just acting as like yes, a sir, floating thanks, turret you know uh the f that, can i trade you thank you can you just put that on my desk yeah. we'll need that later thanks um, cool greg the TIE Fires start laying down fire, and Finn and Ray head toward a quad jumper. Uh, Finn wants to take a different ship just off screen, but Ray says, call, says that's, that thing, that's a piece of garbage. How dare you? Uh, when the quad jumper is blown to pieces, they call an audible and head toward that garbage heap, which just so happens to be the Millennium Falcon. And, then, and then the music cue hits, <laughs> and it's just pure fucking It's so joy. convenient, and I don't give a Who shit. Cares? Who because, cares? Because, like, cares? I mean, why is... <laughs> Why, why is the fucking uh, loading ramp just down? Why is the ship open? Why is the ship functional? How does she know how to pilot? She, who gives a fuck, man? The, the thing that the thing it's that I, I I thinly hold on to is that there I forget what movie it was, and there was a line where they basically like, listen, the force is what's pushing all these elements together. It is destiny. It you are you are on this path because you are supposed to be on this path, and all these things were put there to either help you or like or be an obstacle for you to overcome. I buy it. And also, shut up. It's, it's the Millennium awesome. Falcon. Okay? And when oh. they go on, I literally paused it just to see the entryway. And I was like, it's so good. Like, uh, uh, goosebumps. I'll, I'll never forget being in the theater that first night and uh, hearing that roar of the crowd. Like, this is so badass. Uh, Ray takes the helm, of course, and as Finn mans the main cannon. And we are off. Uh, let's see. Uh, Finn takes one of the fighters out, but the other one blasts the cannon and it gets stuck uh, with no other choice. Ray takes the Falcon into the wreckage of a Star Destroyer and he's like, we're going to do what? Uh, when they fly out, she makes the ship do a flip, which puts the TIE fighter right in uh, Finn's line of sight and bang, gonzo, that thing is Dude, gone. This whole off. scene, I, I had to pause it yeah, and look so over done. at Gia and just be like, this is pure joy. This is pure Star Wars in its essence. The greatest that this franchise can do is make you feel the feeling that I have watching this scene. Compare this to the the chase scene from episode two compare this to the entire opening of episode three which really was trying to just be like let's do everything as cool as we possibly can with ships and all that stuff no this took two and a half minutes and they did every single cool piece of ship choreography you yep. could ending with the unique God shooting damn. and it just feels so satisfying and these characters back and forth being so stoked about doing what they're doing you feel like you're with them yeah. I'm just as stoked as they are doing it it's so cool and so then powerful. every every moment of woo I'm just like yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. just fucking doing it dude and right after that they have this great moment where they they're up in space and they both leave their positions and they run at each other to yep. congratulate like they're just excited both of them are just like and they're yelling you they're like you did great it's so good yeah. and it's 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 
it's so interesting because it's it's a chemistry, but it's is it friendship? Is it love? Is it like sexual tension? Is it it's kind of all of it? Cool. It's just we're excited. I like you. You like me. Or do we just become best friends? We <laughs> yeah, did. that's what it is. You know what it is. <laughs> what it it's, is. It, you know what it's like. It reminds me of like when you were in high school and you would do the high school play and you were like, "We're gonna be friends forever." And we have no idea how hard life's gonna get <laughs> in the next like five years. It's that feeling. You know, it's not even five years. It's like two months. It's after like the two play. months later. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Lieutenant Mitaka comes to deliver the bad news to Kylo that they lost the droid, and Kylo loses his shit on a bank of monitors. And I love this. Scene. Yeah, this is I this is really cool it. because especially later, I, I don't think we've gotten to it. Of like, he feels like he's being seduced by the the light side of the force. Yeah, and uh, there have been so many like think pieces about this stuff and uh, and whatnot. But like every time he freaks out, it's him just trying to uh, dive deeper into the dark side of the force and like really feel his uh, interesting his ang- trying to fight his feelings. Yeah, yeah, I, I, like I trying really to re- try to re- deep dive into yeah. the anger into the, the anytime dark side. he do it. Anytime oh, cool. he feels good. And anytime it's like I gotta fucking do something bad, like I gotta yeah. feel angry again. I, you know? I just love it because it's indicative of a petulant child, a petulant child. Oh me, yeah, where it's just like this: this kid is getting everything he wants, and he's not happy because he has no structure whatsoever, and he's just a fucking piece of shit kid. And I didn't like Kylo the first time I saw this movie, and it wasn't until the second or third time where I was like. Oh no, he's supposed to be a brat. He's oh, yeah. supposed to be oh, this. Yeah. And it, like because it's the first viewing and like all this stuff and we have oh. our own views of Star Wars, it was like hard to grasp what they were going for at first, but yeah, I, I think there's a, I think there are a lot of different elements in movies that are supposed to be a certain way whether right. you like them or not is up to you. Yeah. But this was one of those where it's supposed to be that way and from the get-go I saw yeah, this is what it's going to be, and I'm in. I, I enjoy this characterization of this sort of again, this little jerk ass kid. Dude, he's the bad guy in the in the uh, teen movie, the young adult movie, whose dad owns a dealership. Yeah, you know, and and somehow they his they, dad's they, the governor or something. Yeah, you know, he's just the <laughs> asshole. Uh, and then, well, of course, after he he destroys the monitors, that shit seems like he's just blowing off a little steam when uh, Manaka mentions the droid uh, was was accompanied by a girl, and Kylo goes, "What girl?" and force drags his ass over to him and goes, what girl? Force choke, drag to a real choke. Yeah. Fucking cool. And I'd be like this. I would go back, if I was Lieutenant Manaka, I'd go back to everyone else and be like, I'm never doing that again. HR! HR! Yeah. <laughs> that's a big red zone violation for me. Uh, Finn convinces BB-8 to cover up for him and tell Ray where the base is so they can drop off BB-8 and Ray tells him that she has to go back to Jakku and he's like, why? You got a boyfriend, a cute boyfriend back there? And I love that. Yeah. He's like, you got a boyfriend, a cute boyfriend? <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. And you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, of course, the conversation is interrupted when a tractor beam locks on and starts hauling them up to a freighter uh, thinking it's stormtroopers they hide and attempt to set a trap uh, for uh, the other enemies. Uh, but when the door opens, couldn't be farther from the truth because guess who walks in, ladies and gentlemen? Han, motherfucking lock up your daughter Solo and Chewbacca the Wookiee. And, and lock up your wa- mom too. And lock everyone And up. your grandma. Because they walk on and he goes, Chewie, we're home. Beautiful. Just throw it all away. Yeah. And we're done. <laughs> it's just as good in the movie as it is in the so trailer. Good. And it's a weird thing where it's just like, is it convenient? Is it whatever? Who cares? It works. Yeah. It's cool. I do. I, I I enjoy the kind of throwaway line later of like how they explain how the the quote unquote convenience of them finding it, but there is like logic to how they found it. Well, ship. someone stole from them. We stole from them. We stole from them. They've been looking for it for well, a long well, time. Yeah, they've been looking for it, and but it also has it, it hasn't been on. Like yeah. no one's like turned it on. So once they turned it on and stuff, it was easy to track. So yeah. right, I love it. Uh, so, is this where they said you we were home? I can't remember. Yeah. Oh, that must have been right. Uh, I didn't write it down, but I just thought it was. Uh, of course. Uh, Ray, they they open up the passage because they know exactly where they're at. And they're like, "Get out! What the hell's going on?" Uh, and Ray tells uh, uh, Ray freaks out because he's like, uh, he's like, "Wait, this is the Millennium Falcon, and you're Han Solo." She's like, "Oh my God! Wait, what what's going on? We need your help." Um, they need to get to the nearest uh, resistance base. The droid they're with is carrying a map to Luke Skywalker. Wait, before that though, it's the you're Han Solo, the the general, the smuggler. Is that what she says? What Finn and Ray oh, both yeah, know yeah, who he is, they but all for have different, different reasons. reasons. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's really oh, cool. it's so tight. Yeah. Uh, of course, the banging of the freighter cuts uh, their conversation short. Hopefully, it's not the Wrath Tars. And he's like, You're hauling Wrath Tars here? How'd you get that? And he's like, uh, My crew used to be a lot bigger, which was nice. He's like, How'd you get him aboard? Well, my crew used to be a lot bigger. Uh, to add to things, the uh, Guavian, 
Did I write that down right? Death's gang has boarded the ship too. Han tells Ray that Peruvian. <laughs> maybe, I don't know. Uh, Han tells Ray uh, and Finn to hide so he can talk his way out of this. And Chewie gives him shit, and I love that because Chewie goes rrr, rrr, and he goes, "Yes, I do every time." Yeah. <laughs> Where he's like, "No, you don't." <clears throat> it's fucking Han Solo. So, within it. within three minutes here, back and forth of Han. It's Han Solo. It's baby. it's just the pure Han everything. Because when the, the the two gangs are facing up, that line of the like. But once, twice, twice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't remember that second time. It's like, yeah. wait, what was the second time? Yeah. Uh, that's great. Obviously, the other gang comes in as well. Uh, the the, uh, the Guavians so are led by the Club. Bala, uh, Bala Teek, and then uh, Concha Club comes in as well. And it turns out Han's been doing some devil dealing back here. Uh, <laughs> What's the line that he says, though? I, I I wouldn't believe those little freaks, or what does he say? He <laughs> yeah. says some line that's like, I don't know about that. <laughs> so, it's like <laughs> listening to me. Or it's just watching us out the window. Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, they're here. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, the the uh, Balatik spots BB-8 and realizes he's the droid the first order is looking for. Uh, Ray gets the bright idea to trip some fuses and uh, try to close the blast doors between them so they can save Han, but instead accidentally opens uh, the 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 tanks to the Rathars cages and they start eating everyone alive. And Han like Han hears it. He goes, "I got a bad feeling about this" because he knows exactly what's about to happen. Uh, one of them grabs Finn and Ray saves him by shutting the uh, one of the blast doors and cutting its arms off. They bounce to the Falcon with Han and Chewie, uh, who holds the gang at bay with his dope-ass crossbow, uh, which Han has never used before, but really, really likes in this. He's like, let me see this. Oh, it's awesome. And there's another great moment later. The Rathpar moment is probably my favorite of, like, the... You know, Star Wars always does the the random kind of scene Weird that creature that doesn't have to do much with any of the rest of the movie. Yeah. This is probably my favorite iteration of that, mm-hmm. uh, just because I love their design and I like the choreography of like waiting to close the door and like the, the door magically closed. She's like, "Yeah, that's great luck," or I forgot what she tells him. But there's a, like so there's, there's some cool back and forth there. I, I this this is the one thing I don't like in this movie. This oh sure, this scene yeah. feels like a Star Trek scene it rather like than a, a Star Wars. Exactly, scene. it yeah. feels like JJ was like this was a lost scene from Star Trek, um, and I don't love the CG. Uh, Rathars, and I don't love that they're called Rathars because it's too close to Rancor. It's a lot of just too too much for me. Where I'm like, this is too much. I don't need this scene. It's fun. The armor for the game yeah, the big is cool. the big space worm. The but fucking, I just didn't need this shit. This this is the first scene in this movie that I'm like, this isn't perfectly Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I will say this. I think we're like maybe at this point 45 or 50 minutes into the movie. And unlike the prequels, we've already had like five action scenes, which mm-hmm. is great. Yeah. This movie just keeps fucking moving along. They're like, right when it gets boring, you know what we're going to do? Jump on the Millennium Falcon and take this motherfucker out of the hangar at light speed. Yeah. You're going to do what? It's also, they waste the entire cast from the raid in this scene. I think It's cool that they're like just in a Star Wars movie. And I'm sure that, that, like, that that's what they felt. But they could have been using a really cool The action. entire cast for what? Of uh, the, raid. The, the raid. The action movie. Oh, the is that what the Concha Club was? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know that. J.J. Abrams stuck in cameos from plenty of high-profile Star Wars fans and alumni alike, most of them obscured by latex CGI or Stormtrooper helmet. Those included Simon Pegg as Ungar, the junk dealer on Jakku, Daniel Craig as a Stormtrooper at Starkiller oh, Base, so cool. Oscar-winning composer Michael Giacciano as Stormtrooper, uh, Warwick Davis as an alien at Mouse Canada's Castle. Others simply contributed to the voice, such as Kevin Smith and Ewan McGregor, and also the cast of The Raid. Barrett, what did what did a uh, uh, Han Solo call Kanji Club? Did he say like I because he, he, first he's talking to the the one crew right. before Kanji Club's right. He's like, don't believe those little freaks. I forgot the exact yeah, line. Something, something like that. Little something and like it made me laugh a That's lot. So funny. <laughs> uh, it takes it out. Um, Balatik calls it for the first order and says, "Hey, the that joy you're looking for is, is the Millennium Falcon." Uh, back on the new new Death Star. Uh, over at Starkiller Base, Hux and Kylo talk to Snoke, uh, and they said, let's use the weapon to destroy the Republic. If we destroy the government that supports the Resistance, we can stop them before they find Luke Skywalker. And Snoke's like, great plan. You guys Which, by the way, is this the first reveal that they're on a Death Star? Yes. It's weird. Yeah. It kind of comes out of nowhere, and yeah. I wish it didn't. Me I wish too. we just saw them on the base and never saw... The, the weapon at all, and just the planets just blew yeah. up, and they were like, where did that come from? Because mm-hmm. uh, the idea of Starkiller Base, that it sucks all the energy out of a star, is so cool, but it's just... The way they use it here it's is wasted. so anticlimactic. It's 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 wasted, unfortunately. Uh, Snoke orders preparations and then asks Kylo if he's felt the awakening. There's been an awakening. Have you felt you it, felt too? It. He's like, I have felt it, man. And cool. it is a cute five foot seven brunette. What's mm-hmm. up? I'm mm-hmm. gonna try to force call her a little bit later. You know what I mean? Slide into her force DMs, <laughs> as they say. Uh, to make matters worse, the droid we seek is aboard the Millennium Falcon, 
which is your father's ship, Han Solo. And he's like, Han Solo, I hate him. I hate Han Solo. <laughs> it's like when you call your parents, you start calling your parents by their first names. They're like, fuck you, kid. I've never done that. I've, I've never did. understood that. Yeah, that's weird. Uh, after Ray, uh, of course, uh, it was worth knowing Chewie got shot, so Ray has to help, uh, jump in the co pilot scene. She helps Han fix the Millennium Falcon, uh, and he asks to see BB 8's map. When BB 8 sparks it up, we discover it's incomplete. Uh, why did he leave? And Han goes, he was training a new generation of Jedi, but one boy, an apprentice, turned against him and destroyed it all. Luke felt responsible and walked away from everything. People who knew him think knew him best think he went looking for the first Jedi temple. That sounds really cool. Are we ever going to explore that? Not really. The Jedi were real? Question mark? And she goes, I used to wonder about that myself. And, and he has this great line of dialogue here where Han goes, I used to wonder about that myself. I thought it was a bunch of mumbo jumbo, a magical power holding good and evil, the dark and the light side. The, he's like, that's crazy. But the crazy thing is, it's true. The Force, the Jedi, all of it. It's Jesus all true. Christ. Another fun little fact here. The mumbo jumbo line is a reference to uh, Alec Guinness, Obi-Wan Kenobi, the original Obi-Wan Kenobi. Mm -hmm. uh, in interviews when people were talking about Star Wars, he was like, oh, that's a bunch of mumbo jumbo bullshit. It doesn't matter. Also, this scene is taking place in the same exact room where Luke was training uh, with the visor, and the Han is like, all of this like f fantasy. You believe stuff? in yeah. this? Believe in all this? So it's cool. such a beautiful like uh, like uh, callback, callback, and mirror to that scene. Uh, another little piece of trivia that I saw uh, when I was watching it was they uh, Finn bumps the Dejaric table. And the game is the exact same game. It just picks up where they left off from the, the last moment time they, they were left off. Yeah, isn't that crazy? That's a great. So little like uh, in in the in the in the game, and I think in New Hope, the big thing throws a little thing down, and in this one, the little thing starts getting back up. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Uh, they land on. To, uh, let's, oh, they want Han's help. They got it. Let's go see an old friend of, of yours and get that droid home. Uh, they head for to Kodana. And Finn tries to flex in front of Han, calling him Solo. And he's like, did you just call me Solo? <laughs> and he goes, listen, I'm a big deal in the Resistance. You got you to do all this stuff. And he go, and he tell, <laughs> and then Han looks at him, lets him finish. He goes, listen here, big deal. You got another problem. Women always figure out the truth. Because he just knows he's full of shit. He's like, you're not in the fucking Resistance. I, I was it. a general in the Resistance. You're just some kid trying to, trying to, trying to flex it's, in front of this person. It's so great. Calling him a big deal is just like... It's, he's like and he does it multiple deal. times throughout it's the just, movie. Yeah. It, it reminds me of like, you know, I had several teachers teachers back about I had this one Spanish teacher where like if we weren't paying attention because maybe we were like talking about a video game and right. she would hear us over talking about Tony Hawk she'd be like hey get Tony Hawk in now pay attention to the board like she would like so she just would call us by Tony Hawk or yeah. by whatever <laughs> like hey Dallas Cowboys hey whatever pay attention you I know it. she's, he's such an old man I love it uh, <laughs> outside uh, Han and Ray have a great scene where he hands her a blaster and Ray says I don't need that I can take care of myself and Han goes I know you can that's why I'm giving you a blaster like I need your like you're part of this now and I love that. Um, he offers Ray a job as a crew member on the Falcon, and she's very, very flattered. Uh, but she has to uh, decline the offer because she has to get home to Jakku. And he uh, and he's like, "All right, well, that's dumb." Uh, he takes them to see, of course, <laughs> Maz Kanata, who does not appreciate Han being there at first. But thankfully, where's my boyfriend? <laughs> she really likes that Wookiee. <laughs> This is like, where's that Wookiee? I like that Wookiee. I love that. I love it. I like okay. that Wookiee. And you're like, How, yeah, I can see yeah, that. I can yeah. see little Maz uh, <laughs> going on a little date. Uh, then I think it's Kara Delavine who spots them. Is that the actress who's in this? Oh, my God. It is. Holy I think shit. it's her, yeah. Whoa. And I think, yeah, which is weird, but I think she spots them and calls in the first order. And then some other droid calls in the first Everyone calls in the first order. No, no, no. One calls the resistance. Oh, one calls the resistance. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that she calls the, the first resistance order. Knows to that makes more the sense. The little droid with, like, obviously, like, uh, just like a shock uh, mic kind of thing for a, yeah. Yeah. His, yeah. 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 That's cool. Uh, I always, I, I, yeah, I, that's totally her. Holy wow, shit. Wow. That's really crazy. I would have never yeah, thought no, that. I know. Wow. Good call, Nick. Yeah. Um, I, uh, when the news first leaked that uh, Lupita Nyong'o was going to be in this Fucking movie, I was oh, really, really yeah. sad. I kind of don't like that she was just a CG character. No, I wish yeah, she was in the movie. Same. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just feel like she has a great like on-camera on presence. But I also didn't love that Maz Kanata was CG in general. I thought that was a mistake. I thought that I wish they would have cast a real like it's. It, I, I think the smaller stature, obviously supposed to be like a Yoda character, worked, but. It's it's just so sad because her scenes are supposed to be really really poignant and it kind of kind of just a little bit takes me out that she's just this like cartoonish character. I'm, in front I'm of totally it. fine with her in this movie. Uh, up in space, agree or disagree? Agree to, well, <laughs> there you go. Well, uh, shut down. Uh, up in space, Kylo asks forgiveness. He's uh, praying over something and he asks forgiveness for feeling like he's being pulled back into the light side. Uh, he prays and then when it's revealed that he's praying at the altar of his dead grandfather's burned helmet. Holy shit. And it's fucking awesome. And obviously, spoilers, we saw this scene in the trailer. 
and you were like, well, that's fucked up. But he's just literally like, this thing is like the sacred, like this, this sacred object to him. And he's like talking to it like it's Jesus. And and he's saying like, I, I'm, I'm feeling light feelings. This yeah. is his and like, sanctuary. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, grandpa, you yeah. evil motherfucker. Like, it's just so cool because we, we know what happened know to what Vader. Happens, yeah. He doesn't believe it. Like his, Vader is just as awesome of somebody as Luke Skywalker is to Rey. You know, yes. where it's yeah. just like built up in their heads. So fucking cool. Uh, down, back down in the cantina, uh, uh, Han wants Maz to, to help bring the droid to Leia. But she straight up tells him, no, you got to get back in the fight, dude. It's like, you got to do it. He's like, come on, man. Dude, you got to do this. You know it's, you got to do it. And uh, and then uh, Ray goes, what fight? And she goes, the only fight that matters, the fight against the dark side. Uh, Finn tells her that she's bonkers. There's no winning. It's the first order. And Ma- Maz calls him out for wanting to run. She's like, I've seen a lot, a lot of uh, the same eyes and a lot of people. And you got the eyes of someone that wants to run. Which is a cool line. He's like, yeah, fuck, I want to run. I want to get the hell out of here. And she goes, go over to those guys over there. They'll they'll trade work for uh, for transport out to the outer rims. And he gets up and goes. And Ray's like, what the fuck is going on? Um, and he's like, listen, I can't I can't do this with you. I'm not a member of the resistance. I lied to you. I'm sorry. And it's I like that it's actually another big thing for her. She's like, who cares? Yeah. Do you have to help us now? And he's like, I can't. You don't understand. I'm a stormtrooper. I don't want to go back to that. I'm terrified of these people. I'm just going to work with these guys. I'm out. I enjoy all of this so much because it, it feels so real. Where it's not like uh, the question. Normal movies, like if this movie was lesser, I feel like we'd be like, why would he leave? Like that makes no sense. And why would like all this stuff happen? But here it's like, no, that's his story. Like yeah. he is just trying to leave. He's and him to doing that, I think, really, really works. Uh, while she's watching Finn leave, a voice calls to her from downstairs. The voice of a young child screams, no, come back. She follows the voice downstairs down a hallway as uh, BB-8's clunky ass follows down the stairs. So it's just, <laughs> just a dumb choice so or whatever. Uh, down the long hallway in the room full of junk. She finds an old wooden chest when she kneels uh, beside it. She opens it up slowly and looks in. And what does she find, ladies and gentlemen? Anakin Skywalker, Luke Skywalker's dad's old lightsaber. And you're like, where the fuck did Maz Kanata find that? Because the last time we saw it, it was falling in Luke's hand down a giant shaft on Cloud City. Right? That's the one Mm -hmm. that it is, right? Mm -hmm. Not the green one. Um uh, when she touches it, of course, the world around her goes absolutely nuts, and she gets visions of uh, the past and the future. Uh, she gets visions of Luke Skywalker kneeling beside R2 as something's burning in front of him. Then she gets uh, a shot of Kylo and the Knights of Ren, uh, and then she gets a younger version of herself being left on Jakku. And then finally, she sees Kylo Ren in the forest. Uh, uh, Maz, of course, not when she comes out of the, the uh, visions, Maz tells her that the lightsaber was Luke's and his father's before him, and I fucking love that line because she goes that was Luke's, Luke Skywalker's lightsaber and his father before him and of course it's reminiscent of the moment where he goes I'm a Jedi. I am a Jedi like my father I'm before me. me so fucking cool uh, how the, uh, Ray says I gotta get back to Jakku Maz tells her you go well uh, tugs, hits her with some fucking truth she says you already know the truth whoever you're waiting for isn't coming back the belonging you seek is not behind you but ahead of you take Luke's lightsaber and let the force guide you and she goes I don't want that damn thing I ain't touching it ever again it made me trip balls and she runs out into the forest I, uh, really quick I just love this scene because it's uh, that whole vision is also related to what Maz is telling her of like her fir- one of her first memories is her being left on the uh, Jakku and stuff of showing why she has uh, stayed there for so long, but then also showing her like kind of bits and pieces of history that showing her this greater quest that she is similarly like destined to be a part of. Mm-hmm. Um, I just I really love that, and I love that it ends with Obi Wan saying, "These are your first steps." Yeah, that was cool. So cool. That was cool. Um, and it's good because he obviously like one of the arguments we had about the prequels was that things would just come up, people go, "Okay." And this one, she goes, no, I'm denying this, right? Yeah. You have to have the character push that away. They can't just accept it right off the bat. This is a huge, huge, huge uh, thing for her that she has to wrap her head around. Over on Starkiller Base, General Hux gives a really generic speech in front of troops like old school Nazis <laughs> about ending the Senate and the Republic. And none of that really matters because we haven't seen we the current state of the Republic and the Senate. We have no real idea w- why anyone's doing any of this stuff or w- why they don't. the Republic doesn't have a fucking massive army to quell the First Order's uprising. Why is there a resistance in the first place? Why not a galactic army run by the Supreme Chancellor? and the delegates of 10,000 star systems in the Republic. How did they allow the First Order to pop in the first place? Why is any of this happening? We don't know. It doesn't matter. Because he goes, Th- we're This gonna- is one of the only scenes, I think, that we saw in the trailer that was better in the trailer than it was in yes. the movie. Because yeah. I totally agree. It's like, when we first saw all of them together, it's like, holy shit, this is about oh, to be some the sound real, effect is awesome. real <laughs> dark stuff. But then this, it, it's like, what are you talking about? Stop. The big problem I have with this is that he starts spouting off things about the Republic and the Senate and how we're going to, we're gonna they're, they're all traitors because they've allowed this resistance to, to come up against them. And you're like, that doesn't make any sense. How, 
if we have no context, we have for no like, context yeah. for what what it's the current the only state of the of republic of is, yeah. right? And so the problem is, if the republic is still in the same state of of, uh, of disrepair that it was in thirty years ago, that basically means that everything that Luke and Leia and Han did in the original trilogy don't fucking matter. And that's that's my really sort of a big bone of contention I have with the new trilogy is that like it just kind of goes y'all did a bunch of shit cool it didn't matter because guess what 30 years later Leia's still the leader of this ragtag band of, of rebels and the senate is still corrupt and shitty and they allowed the first order to happen so nothing really changed it's really sad and on top of that I feel not just the original trilogy I feel like the prequel trilogy as well like for obviously it has a lot of flaws but it introduced cool things like Coruscant Mm-hmm. And it's weird when we see Starkiller Base blow up a bunch of planets, and there's one that looks like Coruscant, but, but it's, it's not. But it's not Coruscant. Yeah. And it's like if it was, at least we would have been like, "Oh, oh fuck, shit. that was the the main." We understand, place. Like, like we yeah. get it. We have. It's weird. Um, no, it's uh, really. Oh no, quick. a red a laser is coming towards our planet of Coruscant. They should have thrown in that line of dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> um, really quick, I know it's not super related, but it's kind of related. I wish Battlefront 2's story was actually about the founding of the First Order because that. Seems like what they were building oh, up to be, great. and it would have been cool. Nick, just for you, though, yeah. uh, Battlefront 2, this is canon, not movie spoiler here. Um, there's a chapter in Battlefront 2's campaign that takes place at Mas Kanata's castle. You're but, Luke and you're, you're hitting big alien bugs. But <laughs> it's after that. Years uh, before, like closer to Jedi than, than to this, and it's Han Solo young, but he has a beard. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. I, it's I really weird. That. It's really even in the game, it looks like it's glued on. Yeah. It's really <laughs> fucking. So it's weird. like a Ewan McGregor's. Uh, Is it a win. beard? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, of course, then they fire off the star color weapon, and uh, are standing way too close to it, and probably all get cancer and die thirty years from now. Uh, the beam splits into a bunch of smaller beams, which destroy a handful of planets. And again, I wonder why any of this makes any difference to the Republic that has literally thousands of planets uh, and trillions of people in it. We have no context for why these five no. planets are super important and so we don't care when they get destroyed and it's really it really is a flex no they they were trying they said and i quote we're going to destroy the republic right now like the place that that because if the republic is destroyed then the resistance will have no support the republic is basically funding we're trying to get i think they're trying to get across the republic is funding the resistance and the resistance is trying to take over the first order even though we don't like, in my brain, I'm like, why wouldn't the Resistance or the, or the Republic have a fucking massive army that is going up against this First Order? Why is the First Order the Empire? I don't understand any of this. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it would have been really cooler if, if there was no Resistance, if Leia was literally the leader of the Republic it's army. And, had to, and the Republic. First Order was the Resistance. The First Order was like this uprising terrorist group that just took over and is now trying. And it's a big-ass galactic war again. But instead, Leia's like... Man, I've been on this shit for fucking I'm exhausted. 30 years. Yeah. I'm tired of, of doing the shoestring budget bullshit. You know, it doesn't make any sense. Anyway, uh, let's see. Maz, uh, let's see. Maz gives Finn uh, Luke's lightsaber as the first order attacks. Hey, why not fire up the beam and just destroy this planet too, right? I mean, that would have been smart, but I guess we have to wait for it to recharge with another sun. Anyway, stormtroopers attack and Ray shoots a couple of them. Well, they're trying they- to get the droid, right? Yeah, but there was a moment where um, Snow goes, like, don't, if we can't get the droid, just destroy it. Like, if we if we can't get to Luke, like, just destroy it so they can't get to Luke either. So you figure, oh, like, why not just blow this planet up? I don't know. Yeah. I but, do of course, the, Kylo doesn't want that to happen because Kylo wants to find Luke. I do love the visuals, though, like, uh, of just all the planets getting blown up. I think it's really cool sound design. And, like, the the some of the planets, how large they are compared to the actual beam is, like, staggering. It's really scary. It's terrifying. And I wish it was. I wish so, it meant more. Yeah. So, for instance, for, there's a moment in uh, the 2009 Star Trek where they blow up Vulcan, right? And that is very, very impactful, especially if you're a Star Trek fan, because they've they've destroyed one of the key planets of the Federation. But also, like, the main characters are on the planet while it's happening. Yes, and it including is, like, Spock's mom. But, yeah. I mean, even A New Hope, Who though, is Winona Ryder, who we always will love because she was in Beetlejuice. Oh, my Universe God, Universe. I forgot that that was Winona Ryder. Take a fucking Holy second, bro. Shit. Take a second. Take a second, everybody. Because she comes back Chad, in, be uh, cool and take a second. Just okay. take a second. Chad. And you know, and that made sense because it's Spock's home planet, and Spock's there, and he's watching it, and it's very impactful. And this, we just get a bunch of people who are like, "Oh no!" And you're like, "Are they good or bad? Who cares?" Um, uh, let's see. Also, at this point, why not just give them BB-8? We already have the thumb drive. Just hand it over, and we're like, "Here you go. Here's the droid you're looking for. Don't kill everyone else." Uh, Finn asks Maz for a weapon, and Maz tells me he already has one, the goddamn lightsaber. So he goes, "Cool. I've never trained with this thing anyway. I'll just fire it up and fe- and." Feeling the power of the forest running through uh, the power of the relic, he just starts fucking housing stormtroopers. Boom, boom, boom. Kills them all. Right. Oh, I'm feeling this. I'm feeling this. And then who should stop him? Phasma. 
No, it's not Phasma. It's just a random ass stormtrooper with a random ass anti lightsaber weapon that we have never seen before, and it makes no sense why he has. Oh this no, thing. this moment is fucking awesome, man. It's cool, the but the it's moment's useless. awesome, but it, it is very weird. Of like, why does he have an anti Jedi thing? Like, why would they use that? Why would they need that? They have blasters. They're not here to take. Like, why are stormtroopers equipped with anti lightsaber equipment? It's basically like having a taser. Know. Because you're like, oh, I'm just going to take someone. But it's like they've never. They're it's just killers. like a weird, cool baton that happens to be useful against lightsabers. That's how I. Yeah, that's how I, I see know. it. But I, it's Very that convenient. moment is just a fucking like me like cool. the, the in the community where it's uh, that character has uh, an official name or T R A R. And I fucking love it because all traitor. he says is traitor, <laughs> traitor. <laughs> uh, I love it. I love that Finn has no idea what he's doing with the lightsaber. Yeah. Uh, I wish this was Phasma, though. I wish that he squared off against Phasma a couple more mm-hmm. times because when we see her later, it's just not impactful at all. Yep. But I do love the fact that Finn just gets fucking housed in this, gets knocked back, and as he's about to get his head canoed by this fucking pulsating uh, nightstick, <laughs> guy just gets bamboozled by, by Chewbacca's bow staff or bow blaster. Just oh, fucking yeah. knocked I, back. I, I think it's so cool. I also uh, don't like the... I think this is the second time that... Second and third time that Han references the, that he likes the bow blast or whatever. They like it's as if whoever edited the movie, like two people edited in the same joke and they didn't they weren't aware of the other joke, you know. On top of that, well I, I just don't understand the why are they the, making the this need a to have Han use Chewie's weapon? Because why uh, here's the thing, and this is important for later on. Han's reaction to seeing how fucking juiced up this weapon is of, like, it fucks people up. And then we see Kylo just take that hit like it's nothing. That's right. Yeah. Like Movies of Mikey. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where it's just, like, the, it's not built well, I will agree. But there is a point of them kind of reminding you of, like, how crazy Chewbacca's weapon this is. This reminds me of light future spoilers, the dice, in a way where I'm like, you're trying to make this a Star Wars moment of no, Han wanting to have Chewbacca's yeah. I just think it was cool that at some point he was like, give me the more powerful gun so I can start, like, it's like a howitzer. But, but that's not the it's first like time, cannon. though. Because the, the, the first time they're trying to open the door, yeah. and, and Han's like, give me this thing. Well, no, and he shoots it, he's no, like, he whoa, he, he makes a reaction. He like, takes I'm it from out. Chewie, though, because Chewie gets shot. So Chewie goes, boom, and so he takes the thing from him, which is the bigger weapon, and shoots so he can kill, like, five people at once. It's the next time where he's like, let me see that again. It takes it, it shoots it, and he goes, yeah. "I like this thing." Like, yeah, it's, it didn't it's work. Dumb. Yeah, I liked it, but it is, uh, uh, you know, I it will serves admit that mul- it's multiple purposes for plot and uh, humor. But it, yeah. It could have. Yeah. It's an element that didn't need to be there because obviously, by the way, Han has a heavy blaster, which could have done the trick anyway. Uh, they're outnumbered and they get surrounded, and they're like, "Shit, what are we gonna do next?" And then someone looks over in the distance and sees the fucking cavalry coming in, uh, led by oh Poe Dameron. God. The resistance hits, Dude. and he goes, "I." It's such a cheesy line. And I, it's so cheesy when he says it, but I love it. He goes, "Go straight at him. Don't let those thugs scare you." Hell. And he, yes. and then we see Finn seeing him pilot, and he's like, "That's one hell of a." He's pulling shit out of his ass and just dicing these goddamn. This is uh, probably the flying in over the water, man. So cool. This Such is probably cool my favorite, man. I'll just say it right now. It might be like my favorite moment in all of Star Wars. Wow. Is Finn flying through, taking down all of these Tie Fighters? At, like at just seeing the sort of acrobatics while keeping the same shot of Finn on the ground. Yeah. Like we're seeing Poe. I said Finn. Uh, we're seeing Poe up there doing his thing while Finn is kind of doing his thing too. But Poe's just doing it way better. Yeah, Poe's just eating their It's lunch. the first time in Star Wars that we're not getting the here's what's happening on land. Here's what's happening in the sky. Cut, cut, cut. It's it's all one all thing. All con- yeah. interconnected that's, together. It's super, super rad. To be fair, also, it's the first time in Star Wars where, where someone has told us that this is a great pilot, and then we actually see them being a great pilot. Absolutely. Yeah. Because we're told Luke's a great pilot, and all he really does is use the Force at one point. Yeah. Which you're like, that has nothing to do with yeah. being a pilot. No, you're right. I love this. Uh, X-Wing Blue Squad. Squadron makes its debut in Force Awakens in yeah. the original Star Wars A New Hope. Luke was originally supposed to fly with Blue Squadron, but the blue markings on the Starfighters proved difficult to film against blue screens, so it was changed mm. to Red Squad. Red Squad. That's uh, awesome. That's interesting. Really also, quick. I just fucking love the blue x wings Are you kidding Hell me? yeah, dog. Go. They're hot. Uh, well, there's just one little detail that always annoys the fuck out of me in this scene where it's like it's daytime. There's like all of this like green stuff around them, and then there's just like a random shot of TIE Fighters like uh, coming from a shot of the sun and it looks like the sun is setting but then the rest of the scene does not give a signifier of it being, turning it into nighttime and stuff like that it's just a weird counterpoint shot. it's the force 
That shot's fucking dope. As hell. It is dope, <laughs> but it doesn't belong no, in that scene. You're right. Every it frame is, of painting, it is, man. It is weird. <laughs> uh, but the thing I don't like about it is we don't know that Poe's alive, and this is him returning for the first time, which I'm totally okay with. What I don't like is Finn being like, that's one hell of a pilot. He says it as if he knows it's Poe. And whether or not he does know it's Poe, he wouldn't have said that if it wasn't Poe. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I think he just saw a dude wrecking shit up in the sky and was like, damn, that dude's good. Like, I'm watching LeBron James play basketball yeah, yeah, right yeah. now. Because, yeah. I mean, the shit he's pulling, you're like, that guy is really good. He killed, like, eight it people in a like, row. That it's, to a me cheesy is a, it's, it's cheesy in a yeah. coincidental way where I'm like, all right, this is purely just for the plot. Yeah. But we also needed then to cut to Finn in the in, or to Poe in the ship and him go, woo! Yeah. Because it's awesome. I kind of agree with Tim where I, I think we should have found out that that was Poe, and Poe is still alive when Finn did. Like, I oh, think that would have been... Uh, I I, I, I would have... I feel like that moment would have impacted a little more. Of Like, holy shit, this, like, friend I had for five minutes that I thought completely was toasted, like, is alive, and this is really cool. That's like, one hell of a pilot. And also, he looks like my friend Poe. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I like that you see Poe leading the cavalry, leading the squ- squadron of Expo fighters, and having those great cheesy lines. I just... I mean, it I love all that. Ass. We just didn't need Finn to be like, that's one hell of a pilot. That's fair. Uh, Han, Finn, and Chewie break free, and Finn grabs a blaster, which he's much better at using. He looks up at the sky and sees Poe eating. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of stuff. Uh, out in the forest, Ray encounters Kylo for the first time. Uh, the blaster Han gave her is no match for Kylo's uh, lightsaber. He uses the force to paralyze her, basically. He pins the lightsaber, or the her hand, basically, cool. to the blaster, and then puts the blaster down so she can't move, which is fucking so cool. And I also, I love that he his use of that, Force power is different than Vader's, mm-hmm. right? He uses it in a lot more nuanced ways. Where Vader was like, I'm gonna throw shit at people and just like hurl them all over the place. And Kylo is better at it. He can actually like stop someone from doing something or like take like you know what I mean? He well, has a lot more a more that, surgical I, I way of using surgical, it. It's surgical, but I feel like it's also character driven in terms of he he is just such a little brat and he just wants people to listen to him. Yeah. He just wants to talk he to you. He wants control. And, and I feel like there's many scenes of him just be like, stay here, just listen to me, please. Yeah. yeah. You know, but and it's I, I like that. Yeah. And then he goes, and then he does the cool thing where he like goes like that and knocks her out. Yeah. And then picks her up, which is kind of cool. Uh a resistance ships land. Uh let's see. Let's see. Oh, and then uh, we get a cool scene where Han uh Han sees uh, her body being loaded onto his shuttle. He's he's carrying onto the body and he re- and he sees his son for the first time, and he sees his son carrying the body of the girl that he has kind of adopted as a daughter and he's like shit it's really nothing said he just sees it and it's all in Harrison Ford's eyes where he's like fuck like it's just insane and then you're like it can't get any more emotional and then he and then Finn comes in screaming no and he can't stop her and then we look over and a resistance ship lands and a bunch of people get out the last of whom is Leia and they just look at each other and it's the theme starts the playing music and I start plays. crying because I'm like, fuck. And she looks so good and she's in. What I like about this too is that the, the choice of costume, she's just in a resistance outfit. Yeah. She's just in a normal military mm-hmm. outfit. There's no gown. There's no nothing. There's no purple hair. Nothing. She's just like, <laughs> we're, we're fighting a fucking war. This is what you wear. And they see each other and it's it's You change so, your hair. Yeah. He goes, you change your hair. Oh, my God. I, so I love good. it. C-3PO interrupting. Everything about it, yeah. I, it just feels so good. Uh, some facts here. The symbols on the flag hanging outside Maz Kanata's castle include Boba Fett's Mythosaur skull, uh, Zero the Hutt's Black Sun tattoo, and Hondo's pirate symbol. Uh, there's also the symbol of the 501st Legion on one of the ships. The 501st is a international fan-based organization dedicated to the construction and wearing of screen-accurate replicas of Imperial Stormtrooper armor. That's freaking cool. Well, uh, clone enough. Troopers, Bounty Hunters, and other villains from the Star Wars universe. The 501st First Legion also refers to an in-canon Clone War regiment that gained the name Vader's Fist as they were utilized by Darth Vader when he turned on the Jedi Order during the first years of the Empire. Vader's choking hand. Um, there's also a great little moment here where I just noted that Le- Leia sees Chewie and gives him a hug. I like it. Yeah, for the uh, last time. What's that? For the last time in this movie. Yeah, which, I, you know, I get it. Like, there, there was the big criticism that he just walks right by her later. But like, and I didn't realize that they already, they already had this moment. I thought that was the first time they'd see each other. But they do. She gives them a hug. But also, be, uh, the, for the hugging moment, we can, we'll talk about it more. But uh, Finn took care of him, and now he wants to take care of Finn. You know, when he was hurt. You know. Yeah. Just saying. Uh, yeah. yeah. Let's see. Uh, Han tells Leia uh, that he saw their son. Uh, and then back at the Resistance base, Poe is reunited with BB-8 and Finn, and they hug, and I fucking love it. Mm-hmm. There's like a weird energy here I that like I can't put my too. finger on it, and I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to define it. I, I don't know what it is. In it. Yeah, yeah, man. And I, I, in it. like at first, I'll be honest. When I saw this the first time, I was like, oh, they're angling toward these two characters, like being romantically involved with each other, and I would be totally for that. And they just, I guess, they didn't go that way, but it could have been cool. Mm-hmm. That's all I'm saying. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, no, one more movie. Yeah, it's true. Uh, let's see. Poe takes uh, Finn to meet with Leia, and they hatch a plan to save Rey. Uh, Chewie has a little scene where he gets the hit on a nurse, and you're like, what's up, Chewie? You get some, dog. Uh, PP8. <laughs> I love that that's what you take from that scene. <laughs> well, because he's like flexing. He's like, rah, rah, rah. She's like, oh, that sounded very oh, scary. Sounded very he's scary. trying to impress her. He's like, what's up, nurse? No, what's I thought she later? was talking to him more like a child. Like, I, I, I enjoyed like, oh, and oh, you made a dinosaur drawing. Very cool. Like, <laughs> you know what? Potato, potato. <laughs> that's how you saw it. That's how I see it. Chewie got to get some. So we got to put a mini Wookiee into the back of that little Millennium okay, Falcon. Just uh, Leia and Han <laughs> have a great scene where they talk about Kylo, uh, and they start playing this, the fucking theme again, and it, it kills me. Uh, BB-8 finds R2, which he's been in low power mode ever since Luke went away. Why? I have no idea. He probably has the missing part of the map, too. Too bad we can't fire him up. He's only a fucking android. Like, we can't just hook him up to a new USB port and let's go. Guess not. Guess R two D two can shut himself down, and no one can turn him they, on. They have USB in the fu- uh, C in the future. Oh, that's a hard part. Yeah, he's a yeah. Uh, he's they the talk, printer one. Lay and Han talk about how Snoke. It was Snoke's fault. Snoke seduced our our son to the dark side, but we can still save him. If Luke couldn't reach him, how could I? Asks uh, uh, Han, and she goes, "Because Luke is a Jedi. You're his father. You're his father." Oh my God, it's so beautiful. And then she goes, "There is still light in him. I know it." And that's so. Good. I mean, it's not like they're still good in him, but she says like, they're still light in him. It's... Is this when she says, bring him back? Yeah, bring him back. Oh, my God. Uh, Ray wakes up in the torture chamber over on uh, Starkiller Base, and Kylo's there. He's been watching her sleep. Not creepy at all. He takes his mask off, and he is hot. But in that sort of, like, loner-damaged kind of way, like, uh, like the kind of guy that wants you to know that he's got emotional scars because he tells you I've got emotional scars. Dude, that's I funny. Lo- in my, love theater, my theater there. laughed. Yeah, when he took off the mask, there was like a couple of women that were weird. like, "He's weird. He's kind of goofy looking." Yeah, love his look. <laughs> Interesting. Love it. I yeah, like it. I, it's great um, casting for the past movies as well, where he kind of looks like a combination. Like his hair is like very seventies, like wavy almost, uh, like Hans uh, back in the day. It also kind of looks like Anakin's in yeah. a way, where it's uh, it's just it's Hayden good. Yeah. It's good. Um, Family casting. You know? I and I love Adam Driver. I think he's great. I think he's great in this role. I love everything about yep. it. I think they nailed the fact that it is kind of creepy and, and he's trying to be maybe he's trying to be sexy, but he's not nailing it. It's perfect for the character. Uh he sees, of course, into Ray's thoughts. Uh he sees how lonely she was on Jakku, how Han is the father uh she never had. Uh but when he presses her harder to find the map, it backfires and she acclimates into his mind. But I, and, I love that even the like Han, like it's the father you never had. Hey, it's it's not that great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Such a good line. Um, and he and she sees into his brain, uh, just like Harry did to Voldemort, and he's afraid he'll never be as strong as Darth Vader. And then he's like, "What?" And then Hux and Kylo meet with Snoke, and Snoke wants Ray brought back and brought brought to him. Uh, also, they track the resistance to the Illenium Ill- Ill- system and prepare the weapon. We're gonna go kill them now. Uh, Ray, and then is by herself, and she realizes that she's uh, there's a stormtrooper behind her. So she goes, "Fuck it, I'm gonna use this old Jedi mind trip and try that." And she goes, "You're gonna uh, you're gonna." You're gonna release me from my, my chains and uh, and let me go or, and leave the door open. And he goes, and it's great because he's like he's at first he's like I'm gonna fucking tighten those chains and beat your ass, rebel scum. And if you don't realize who this is, it's amazing because that's Daniel Craig, yeah. and I love it so much. And then she goes, then she centers herself and really feels the force and says says it again. And he goes, I'm gonna release you from this and leave the door open. And as she's walking out, as he's walking out, she goes, Oh, drop your weapon. He goes, Man, I'll drop my weapon. <laughs> <laughs> he drops it. So the story apparently goes time, that though. he was filming um, Spectre, I think. Or Skyfall, on the was it Spectre, on the set on, on one of the lots adjacent to it, and just popped over because he's a Star Wars fan. And JJ's like, "You want to be in the scene?" And I like to believe that's exactly how it went <laughs> <That's so laughs> in cool. my brain. Uh, Ray, of course, gets free. Uh, Kylo finds the torture room empty and has a fucking conniption fit. And I love this comedic beat where two stormtroopers around the corner go, "Nope," and they just walk the other yeah. way. <laughs> it's so good. Uh, back at the Resistance, we learn that Star Killer Base is bigger than I, this. I hate this whole scene. It's. A circular base. It's so, it's it, well. It's like a Death Star. No, it's not. It's bigger. And they literally show you how big the Death Star is and how big Star Star Killer Base is. And you're like, what does it matter? The Death Star had the, the uh, could destroy a planet. It doesn't get much worse than that. It's going to destroy multiple planets. I, Who cares? I don't hate the, all of this stuff. The only thing I'm really confused about Star Killer Planet. And I was telling you, Tim, can it fly around? I it must. It must have to because it has because to get close it has to, to take, star. It, it has to get close to stars. I. It's that concept uh, to me is confusing. It's a little. The rest wacky. of it is like, all right, this is dumb space stuff. Maybe it has a big hyperdrive, like five times bigger. I mean, it must, right? <laughs> uh, but it doesn't matter because this band of, of resistance has learned from the rebels before them. They're like, we got the ability to pull a foot. Of- Pull a fucking quick plan out of our asses. How do we kill this thing? This guy was a this kid. Finn was on on there for a while. He must know 
in-depth schematics because he was to, a structural I used engineer. To shoot some fucking Wombrants. <laughs> <laughs> this kid talking about tattoo again. <laughs> fucking all right. just to be easy. Uh, th- I hate this part. Okay, yep. Finn is a stormtrooper. He has one job: sit in a fucking barracks until he has to go kill things. He would not have any inkling how the mechanics of this vastly intricate fucking Death Star work. He's not a structural engineer. He's not a mechanical engineer. He's not a me- a f- a anything. He's, He's not a, a scientist at all. He worked in the sanitation department, evidently, which is stupid anyway, because they wouldn't have a fucking stormtrooper working sanitation. They'd have a sanitation guy doing that. I don't like anything about this. It's rushed. It's stupid. They should have kept all of this for the MacGuffin and the main thing they had to overcome in episode two, and they should have failed miserably at doing that. And then Starkiller Base could have been blown up in, in episode, or excuse me, episode nine. Anyway, they figured out they're like, there's an oscillator that if we blow up, it'll fucking blow up the whole planet. Cool. Why not? Cool. Let's go after that. Whatever. How are we going to get past the shields? Leave that to me. I'm Han Solo. I'll figure it out. Great. As they prepare to leave, uh, we get another great scene between Leia and Han where Leia kind of flirts with Han a little bit, and it's everything. This is where she says bring him back. Yeah, she goes, no matter how much we fought, I've always hated watching you leave. And he goes, that's why I did it. So you'd miss me. God. I I love it. They hug one last time, and she says, if you see our son, bring him home. There is one line between them that I didn't like, and I think it was a little bit prior to this moment where he, he says something to the effect of, like, uh, but I've, her response is essentially, and don't bring up that time on the Death Star. Yeah. Like, it was such too, a... It I, reminds I, me a little bit too much of the prequels where they only remember the last movie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Really quick, is Leia kind of CG'd up in this uh, in this scene where she... Every time she, like, I watch this and she goes to hug Han, there's something off about... Her, how her face... It may have been like how it, like, smoothie. How it, like, rests on his, like... Chest and stuff. There's always something that like threw me off about. Carrie I think it's just too hard of a hug because he kind of like really hugs her hard. I'm like, I didn't they're notice old. Anything. These are old people. Know. They'll break fast. I might just be. Uh, I don't know. I'm with you on that. It's a little off putting, but I found it more endearing than off putting. So, uh, of course, Han's plan to get through the shields involves basically coming out of hyperspeed at the very, very last second before they crash into the planet. And how he calculates that, he just knows. He just knows. Fuck me. Uh, the they cr- they crash land on the snow uh, the snow uh, of Star Killer Base, and then Kylo senses immediately that Han's on the planet uh, out in the snow. Finn admits to Han that he he worked in sanitation and has absolutely no idea how to take those shields down. Uh, and he goes, oh, "I know. We'll use the Force." And then Han goes, "That's not how the Force works." <laughs> I love that. I fucking love that line. <laughs> uh, once inside, che- uh, Chewie blasts a stormtrooper into fucking next Tuesday, and they kidnap Phasma to get her to drop the shields. And I absolutely hate this part. This is dumb. Why would th- this leader of all of the stormtroopers just roll over at the thought of having it be blasted in the face? Especially given the fact that you know that if Kylo picks up on the fact that you you, you did this, he's going to torture your brain to death. Yeah, it's and it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense, and is all of it. This entire scene just feels wrong. Everything between Finn and, and Phasma is so stupidly done. And it's sad because because Phasma is the physical embodiment of everything that, that Finn has to overcome. And he just does it very quickly where he's like, I'm the I'm the leader now, Phasma, I'm the leader. And it's like, no, she should have broken free. She should have never been in this to begin with. He should have just been like, I know where the shield controls are. We'll go take that down and we'll do it subtly. Also, why wouldn't people just turn the fucking shields back on? There's not someone up in the bridge that's like, hey, I think the shields are off. Can you check that? And Andy's like, yeah, hold on a sec. Yeah, the shields are off. We'll turn it back on. Done. Anyway. I guess they're all idiots. Yeah, a lot of it fell down. Uh, then they make a fun joke about dropping Phasma in the trash com- in the trash thing, and like, because that happened already. Remember that? Remember when that happened when they were in the trash thing? <laughs> Nostalgia. And see, that's the problem is when there are scenes in this movie where these characters are acting the way we want them to, and they're funny and quippy and stuff, but it's for the extent of getting to a nostalgia beat instead of getting to something that makes sense yeah. for the plot. It only works when you get all three of those things at once. And that's why we can say, oh, the Millennium Falcon, it's a piece of garbage joke works because we're like, oh, I buy this for the story, for the nostalgia, and because it's funny. And also because they used to refer to it as a, as a hunk of junk and all that back stuff, in the yeah. day. Uh, yeah, this, this to me, this, the third act of this movie is where everything starts to really fall apart, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, it's not that it's bad, it's just it's that it's bad. very it's rushed. Just, it's Fine. You know, like, let's take a beat from Return of the Jedi where there are people, uh, like, fighting in a space battle trying to get inside of the, the second Death Star because the shields are still up and they're dying. And if Han and Leia don't figure out a way to get that goddamn shield generator down, Lando and everyone else up there, all their friends are fucking dead. Meanwhile, Luke is sitting in the throne room, powerless to watch that. That's a cool third act. This one, they turn the shields down and Leia's like, go! And they all just go! And they start doing attack runs on this oscillator, and they're like, it's not powerful enough. 
but none of, and they're kind of dying, but not really. And you're like, all right, whatever. Um, anyway, it's it, very hard to tell like whether they're winning or losing yeah. through, through a lot of this. And also, it's it just there doesn't seem to be um, the, the biggest problem I have with this is that there's no real ticking clock. They say at one point, oh, the sun, as soon as the sun goes down. Like as soon as the, the the machine is done sucking all the sun's energy, when the, when it when it turns to darkness, you know, symbolism I get it. Uh, the weapon will be ready to use and will go. But it's like I, it's not as impactful as in A New Hope, where they're like, we're going to be in range in ten minutes, and there's a literal ticking clock, five minutes, two minutes until we can blow up this the the planet they're on. Right? Uh, no, it wasn't Alderaan. It was um. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. In this year, it's like what what's happening? I don't know. It's cool. Yeah, anyway, no. But on top of that, it's not just a literal clock. It's also we're seeing the rebellion in a new hope get one by one destroyed in the trench, and it's down to the last couple ships. And you, we know that as an audience that literally at the end of it, it's up to Luke. Like, he's he, it. He's he it. He's all left. Do the thing, or uh, they, they've already told us. We know what the thing is. Yeah. And then and the in this, it's in like you got to just keep shooting at this thing, and that was your plan, and yeah. it didn't really work. And, and it sucks because you can tell that they really didn't care about that stuff they're like we just need a big final like yeah. air air fight because the the land battle the kylo and ray stuff i think works uh but then there's this other moment where they're like we got to go find ray and then they just run into her because she's already freed herself and you're like okay well that was easy everything's real easy in this and it's sad because they should have had to save ray from something like in in a better world finn should have had to literally overcome at least clash with Phasma at this point and maybe not be beat by her but be beaten back by her but outsmart her in a way where he saved Rey and then they saved their final battle for another day but instead Phasma is just this useless character that has cool armor like apparently has been promoted to a level of incompetence within this organization similar to a lot of VPs that we used to work under uh I also like when I also like when uh Rey is climbing on the wall and like opens a Com- uh, fucking compartment and it comes out of the wall and she gets in and I would in my mind my paranoia is like you're gonna, crushed? You're gonna f- what you don't know what's in there yeah, <laughs> but, the like, yeah. but but the but but I like I like that because um, I don't know if she knows like how one to one the architecture uh, like of the Empire ships to first order stuff but you can get a sense of all right I kind of like understand how all of these like um, panels thing work. panel and not yeah. even just panels but like how this infrastructure works. And so that, that I, I really enjoyed that mm. aspect of it. I also want to give a special shout out to the production design of Starkiller Base because yeah. it looks like it's been carved into the mountain. So cool! It's so fucking rad. But again, how does that work? I well, you don't just get it. Well, you drill the it into the mountain. Spring. You got big fucking things. They got fine. They're fine. They Forget got, they got everything light. you know. How does a, how does a lightsaber laser stop? It doesn't. <laughs> oh. Wow, it's a long saber. Uh, when they get outside, of course, Han looks up and goes, "Wow, the fleet's really not getting it done." Luckily, Chewie has a bag of explosives that he's been carrying since Return of the Jedi. The last time they had to blow up a shield generator, he's like, "I got that bag." Still, there's a lot in there. It's like how Kevin stores shit in the back. They were like, "We're never gonna use it again." And then I go, "We're never gonna use it. Let's throw it out." And then we have to use it again. I eat my fucking words. I hate it. Uh, Han spots Kylo as he's crossing this. So they head in anyway. Start planning and planning these cool uh, thermal detonator-looking devices, but they're like smoother. Like everything's smoother in this. What do I think it's called? Smoothie. And and then of course Han spots Kylo crossing a massive bridge, and he calls uh, he calls out to him. But instead of calling him Kylo, he calls him Ben. And I know you don't like this, Tim, but this no, it's not me, that I don't like. This it. gets me right in the fucking heart. I love it. It gets me in the heart. It's just when you think about it for two seconds, it makes. Absolutely but I mean, no if you're sense. gonna name your kid something, you go let's name him after that guy that was like a general in the army then and helped save him us. Obi Wan <laughs> or Luke. Or... His name's Obi Wan. Ben was a weird name he pretended to be that Han never even knew. But they, yeah. his friends called him Ben. Leia never even knew. He was known at the local watering hole as Ben. You know the watering hole that that Han had nothing to do with. <laughs> anyway. I like to think I like to think because uh, Luke um, knew Obi Wan as Ben for most of his life, that when they were trying to come up with baby names, Luke might have been like, I I, I don't I kind of like Ben, and they're like, oh that that name actually sticks. You no, know, which like is how people... most fucking baby names come up. Oh, it's like cool. how, yeah, it's like how people name their kids stupid names like Andy. I'm not saying that it's like like inconceivable that they would name him Ben. I'm yeah. just saying that like it hits me. But then I'm like, it shouldn't hit me. Huh. That shouldn't work. We okay. have a and You're Wrong, though. by the way. That was not Cara Delevingne. It wasn't? It was an actress what? named Anna Brewster. I think it's just the eyebrows are so uh, thick. Okay. Damn. I was convinced. We pulled up a picture. So I thought it was Cara Delevingne. We pulled up a picture, man. It, that, it was her. That's from Arvel Krynan. Thank All right, you, Arvel. Thank you, Arvel Krynan. Uh, anyway, he tries to talk some sense into his son. He says, Snoke is using you for your power. It's... Uh, and then uh, he goes, it's too late. And he goes, it's not too late, man. I can help you. And he goes, I'm being torn apart. 
I want to be free of this pain. I know what I have to do, but I don't have the strength to do it. And I love think, his acting. Yeah, you think he's talking about trying to break free from the dark side, but he's not. He's trying to. He's talking about eliminating all the light from him, which means that he has. He says, "Leave the past behind. Will you help Kill me? it if you have to. Will you help me?" And Han says, "Yes, anything." And Kylo hands him the lightsaber, and as he does it, he has that moment where he's, where Han goes to grab it, and he won't let and him. And the take music it. cue changes. And the music cue changes, and you're like, "Oh fuck!" And he just lights it up and stabs Han right through the chest. And I'm like, you little motherfucker. I was bawling in the theater. Oh, I hated it. <laughs> and the saddest fucking thing of all, and the perfect bit of direction, is that Han, liter- Han literally reaches out and touches his son's face and then falls to his death. Like, the last thing he does is just touch him one more time. And I love it because it feels so not Han, that motion. Hmm. You know, and I, I think that it's so powerful that his last thing was, I'm not trying to be a cool guy. We've I, also never seen I him like be a father. I'm, I'm, yeah. yeah, I'm trying you to know? be a dad it's right now. It's fucking awesome. Yeah, and he beautiful. also does that, obviously, uh, another little piece of good storytelling is that, uh, or visual storytelling is that as he's doing that, the sun is going dark outside. So yeah. the weapon is fully powered up. So it's, we've all And yeah, and that turn happens as soon as like, you know, the the the, the, the sun shaft stops shining through that room. Yeah. And then we go back to the resistance headquarters and Leia feels But Chewie's also crying. Leia has that moment like that Yoda would have where like something's happened or like Ben has had when, he, when, when yeah. Alderaan got blown up where he has that... He like she literally loses her balance for a second, and like is taken aback by it. But you know who's not taken aback by it? Chewie, because he's fucking pissed. Yeah, and he just lights Kylo up. He doesn't even miss a beat. He just shoots him in the gut and then blows. <laughs> just starts blowing yeah. everything up because he's like, "Fuck it, I owe this guy a life debt." And I just totally fell. Chewie, where were you on that one? Shoot him in the head. Anyway, uh, everything starts to blow up around him. They bang it's out. Nephew. <laughs> man, fuck him, man. He just killed Han. I'll tell you what, if you, had, if you had a nephew and he kills you, I'd fucking smother that little motherfucker. You, you said that Kylo Ren is Chewie's nephew? Well, like, you know how, like, it, your, like your parents have okay. friends and you call them like, uncle and aunt? The, the, the way you stated it, it was just like, do you think that Chewie and Han are brothers? <laughs> nah, I got Tim, it. do I need to explain this to you? They're brothers in the <laughs> fact that they're yeah, yeah, not anyway. literal. Uh, the oscillator is damaged, but it's still functional. Ray and Finn make their way toward the Falcon, but Kylo cuts them off. Uh, Kylo first pers- force pushes Ray into the fucking trees, and then uh, Finn goes, oh no, Ray, and just throws his blaster down for no reason. Not that it would have helped him anyway. And then runs to her side. I'm like, what are you doing, dude? This guy's yeah, gonna kill you. you. Uh, and then he picks up her lightsaber and says, fuck it, I'll take this guy out with this lightsaber. Uh, even though it did not go, didn't go that well so for me great. the last time. Uh, and it does not go well for him this time. He gets just destroyed by Kylo, even though Kylo's like doing that cool thing where he's shot in the gut. He's like hitting his own gut Dude. to like make it stop. Let's get the anger cool. going. Yeah, just, oh, yeah. Oh, like get the adrenaline. I want to feel the pain. And I love it because he's like he is weakened by this shot. That shot yeah. did take a lot out of him, which is why he is able to get you know uh, uh, get got by Ray later. Anyway, but also is this is this the f- one of the first moments in Star Wars where we're actually seeing light reflect on the characters? Did and that the, happen in the and, prequels? And the at reason all? is because they they actually practically used lightsabers that had the colors they were supposed to be. Yeah, so they cool. didn't Shit. all just need to be digital. There was digital added later, but yeah, yeah. it's and it's so cool because that scene, which again was in the trailer of Finn picking it up and doing the stance, like the samurai stance. Well, and also it shoots Kylo out though, when the scene we just, yeah. when he turns oh, like, the I first love it. teaser scene that we saw, it's like when he pushes. It's it just out, so yeah. visually striking, and like they designed, they're like, we're gonna do it in the snow, so you could really see the colors, and like, ah. It I also love how, uh, I, I love how Kylo's saber is so, er, it's so erratic, it's so angry. Well, it's the it's, sound, it's cr- it's crackling. It's, even, even the hilt of it, it's so unstable. The hilt you know? of it looks unfinished when he ha- when he goes to hand it to Han. There's like wires and shit wrapped around. It doesn't look like. It's indicative that he hasn't finished his training yet. And when you finish your training, obviously the, the final thing was supposed to be like either the trials or I don't know, you have to make your own lightsaber. And it looks like he just skipped all those steps and made it. And that's why it doesn't quite work right. But yeah. it's just nasty looking. Right. Yeah, even when they're talking, you know, lightsabers are like this sort of pristine weapon and they are, they're the fancy man yeah. sort of weapon. But Kylo's. It's an elegant. <laughs> it's so like pissed off. Yeah, his is anything but elegant. <laughs> yeah. Uh, of course, uh, Finn is even even hurt. Kylo's a much better swordsman than Finn. Has no problem uh, disarming Finn and then cuts him like right at the back with the with the lightsaber. And Finn is out. He's gone. Uh, and then we have a wonderful beat where he looks over and it harkens back to the lightsaber sitting in the snow back on Hoth. Mm-hmm. And he looks over and he sees Luke's guy, uh, Luke's lightsaber and he goes, fuck it, I'm going to take that thing. And he goes to pull it to him and it starts going toward him and then whoosh, whizzes right past him into the hand of Rey. <laughs> and it's so cool that you're like, you know what we should do? We should just take that scene and put it right in Endgame. And it worked again. It got me again. It got me again. Yeah, uh, this moment every time gets they, it. 
it hits me so hard. hard my nipples are just shooting i went through four Woo! t-shirts last Woo! night guys wow. yeah lactating yeah uh they and they no, fucking, they're sharp oh, okay and they get <laughs> they're just wet God, and boy. they get it on outside poe squad goes on a trench run because that happened before and poe heads into the oscillator and starts blowing it in, uh, blowing it up from the inside out as it explodes around him he nearly makes it out the whole base starts falling apart as ray and kylo duke it out in the snow uh they clash sabers one last time and kylo offers trainers like you're you're untrained i can teach you you need a teacher i can show you the ways of the force and at mentioning the force it kind of echoes in ray and she steadies herself for a second and she musters the power and then she just fucks him up uh and cuts him like a gas i think she ca- gashes him from the shoulder to the face and this that's how he gets that scar right um yeah i don't know if it's all that i think it might i think it was just like face. right here, it was like yeah, yeah was, anyway she knocks him down and before they can go in for the killing blow uh there's just a giant fissure that opens chasm. up in between a chasm opens up in between them and literally puts distance between them and he looks at her and she looks at him and she just runs away uh she goes over and finds finn half dead uh and chewie picks him up on the falcon uh it's mentioned that kylo and hux get away too he's like uh, kylo you got to come to me snow because like you got to come to me to complete your training is like you probably should have just completed that a while back because like then he could have beat all these people pretty easily uh they take off into space as the star killer base explodes and i love this scene because i love the, the effect in this because yeah, it explodes too. and it turns back into a sun yeah did you notice that it's super cool a star it's real 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 cool and I, I love that they're like let's make this look different than what they yeah. from what people expect from the death star exploding uh, uh they the falcon lands back at the resistance base uh and chewy walks right by leia and i don't have a problem with this but apparently everyone else does uh because leia finally locks eyes with ray and no words are exchanged the, and there's no need for that. They just hug, and you get everything you need to know out of that. Han meant something to both of them, and he's dead, and they're just going to hug right now. They're going to share a moment and, and console each other. Uh, and then R2 Some D2- fans were none too pleased when Chewie and Leia just walked past each other following Han's death and the destruction of Starkiller base, with Leia instead choosing to embrace Rey, the relative newcomer. Considering Leia and Chewie's long history and their shared loss, it's hard to fault the fans on this one. It didn't make much sense, and Abrams has said he now regrets how distracting it proved to be. Well, they should have just left Chewie out of it. It needed to be between Rey and Leia because they needed to have that connection, especially going forward to the next movie. We could have just seen Chewie carrying Finn or something, but he's just kind of walking with his little hairy ass. It's not about Finn. It's about Han Solo. No, I know that, but like, if we needed Chewie in the scene, we could have had him doing something that was important, like carrying the body of Finn to like to help him. In, or, in, or in order for them to not hug. In order yeah. for them not yeah. to hug, but he okay. just kind of like slowly walks past her. And I didn't notice this the first time. And I don't have a problem with this because they've already had that moment, and you're assuming they'll talk at some point. But you know, I get it. I get why people are pissed off. It didn't. It didn't necessarily matter to me. It's like when our community got real mad that Elise beat uh, out Troy Baker in the in the best friend yeah. tournament. You know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, R two D two fires back up for no reason and shows everyone the rest of the map to Luke, and then R two D two is entirely CGI in the film's final scenes when the beloved droid wakes up and reveals the location. Uh, then Leia is like, you know what? We found Luke, and I'll go myself to convince my brother to come back and help us with the resistance. I know he feels bad about what happened, but I am the only person that can tell him it's okay. Oh, wait, no, Ray, you want to go? A person he's never met before? Go for it. See, I'm sure you'll be. I'm sure you'll have a much better time convincing. I'm 100 percent with you, and I'm also like t- carrying this back to like, why did Leia hug Ray at all? Who is Ray to you at um, all? Good did point. You have a conversation with Han that we didn't see on camera about. Han thinking this girl's pretty cool. Sure, maybe that happened. But like, why nice are we? Yeah. Why are we supposed to believe that she would hug Ray over Chewie, or even hug her at all? I don't know. I mean, other than if, the only thing I can, and again, it's not in the movie, so I can't use it as an argument. But Leia does have force powers, and she, True. And I think she is aware of of the dynamic of what's happening enough within her organization that she understands that Ray. I just think that's all. I, I'm with that. It's equally weird though that then, and they've Leia also had conversations about Ray. how much. They have, when they have to go save her, that they've had conversations about how she, important she is to Finn and probably Han at some point. You have to imagine it was like, I offered this kid's like important. This kid has, I like this kid, but who knows? I don't know. But she is also, you have to imagine Leia is empathetic because she has force powers so she can feel the pain of others. And you have to imagine she's, who the fuck knows? We're stretching here. I didn't care, but whatever. People can have their problems with it. Uh, so uh, uh, Ray kisses Finn goodbye as he's uh, being rehabilitated. Uh, he's still knocked out, but you have to imagine he feels that kiss. Uh, and then she boards with Chewie and R2, uh, the Millennium Falcon, and Leia gives her the traditional parting message of a Jedi. May the Force be with you. Um, and they take off with that. Ray, Chewie, and R2 take off uh, to go find the missing Luke Skywalker. And... You know, the movie could have ended right here. I would have been okay with it. But I remember sitting in theaters going, oh, they're going to find him. That's cool. And they land on this really cool planet.
planet uh, where you assume, I guess it's the first Jedi temple because it looks kind of like a temple-ish. I don't know. Uh, and then, uh, you know, this is where Rey embarks on her very first Jedi task as a trainee, which is just to, come, to climb a lot of stairs. There's a lot of stairs in this one. Uh, and I love the music here because it's got that, like, I think it's Luke's new theme or something. I don't no, know it's, it is. it's Ray's no, theme, it and it transitions the into the theme of the Force. There yeah. you go. Uh, of course, when she reaches the top of the island, she finally finds Luke, and he's wearing an awesome gray robe, which I thought was interesting. So it's not the traditional Jedi robe. It's not the dark side robe. It's gray. It's kind of in the middle. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, and he has a fantastic beard, and he has a really weird look on his face. He's got milk in his mouth. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's future spoilers, buddy. Uh, and Ray takes out his father's lightsaber out of her bag and offers it to him, and the music swells, and we hold on this shot for a really, really, really long time. We didn't need this stupid fucking helicopter shot. And then oh, it's it, so And bad. then it pulls out, and we get a helicopter shot. <laughs> or just drone so the, or the music works out perfectly, and then circle white to the credits, directed by J.J. Abrams, and we're done. They I, should have started the Force music earlier, and then the movie should have ended on Luke. Not the worst shot Possibly one of the worst shots in Star Wars history. What was no the way. direction there, Luke? Which look, is the helicopter look, shot. They it's may as well so put like bad, a GoPro but... on the lightsaber know, and like hand it, <laughs> and, like, it like the point of view of the lightsaber. Oh, yeah. There's, I feel like there's a couple bad cuts and bad shots in this. I love how long we go without dialogue and it's just music. Great music, by the way. I agree the Force theme should have came in earlier. Uh, but I, I love her walking up the thing and us not really knowing where they're going with it and seeing Luke and him not saying anything. Some shots do feel like they last a little too long, but everything this scene represents, and for the most part, I'll give it a 90% out of 100. The 10% is distracting, but fuck, this is hype as hell, and I love it. I feel like it's a perfect end to this movie, starting with Luke Skywalker has vanished. It's just getting there was a little weird why would uh missing link in chat asks why was it a bad shot it's like porn like you know it when you see it okay and when you see a bad shot like that's like badly composed in terms in terms of like blocking and framing but also like why is that why is that the moment they chose to it's leave a very us with? personal scene right it's this very emotional scene and the the reason why that ending shot is like just a bad choice as an ending shot they put it in somewhere in the middle of the scene fine whatever but you are far away from the characters they're moving in a weird uh, kind of angle it just feel you feel disconnected from what's actually going on, yeah. and that's I feel like they're like we spent jarring. a lot of money on yeah. this fucking helicopter. We gotta use this somewhere, you know. It, it's also weird that this scene in the beginning of it, when she first starts walking up the the mountain, it's the only shot in the entire movie that has a fade cut, like. Hmm. It fades that. between two shots of her walking up, and it's like... It cross dissolve? Yeah, it's cross dissolve, and it's really, really weird. I don't I, know if there's one of those in the entire Star Wars franchise. I have no idea. I, I, th- my, my critique with the scene is that it just goes on too long, and I, I, I think that there's a there's one too many cuts in between him looking at her, she looking back, then he looks back at her, then she looks back at him, then, there, then it's a wide shot of them looking at each other, and then it's a bigger wide shot of them circling around him. It should have literally ended... It should, she should have walked up and seen it, and we should have seen him in the robe and known it's Luke. And then she pulls the lightsaber out and offers it to him. And as he turns around, he takes off his, and we see Luke for the first time. And that should have been yep, it. I Done. Agree. And I'm right with Barrett. Barrett made a very important point, which is that when you're when you're in a wide shot, the visual storytelling of that is that you want to be farther away and disconnected from the two things that are happening. But if you got this incredibly emotional moment where two hours and fifteen minutes of a movie are building up to this, where Ray sees this mythical person who she has staked a lot of her future on and they lock eyes for the first time i want to see their fucking eyes and i want to see a close-up of the thing she is offering him which is the thing that is the embodiment of all of her hopes and dreams that she's handing over to this guy and placing her trust in him and then we cut out to this grand sweeping white shot that goes on way too long it just was a little bit weird but i'm with tim eh, solid 85 percent. that could have been 50 percent better <laughs> I love that math. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Let's do a little bit of Ragu Bagu. Dun 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 Kylo. Dun 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 dun. He's the best. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, guys? Welcome to Rad Guys Talk Bad Guys, a podcast within a podcast where we rank all of the Star Wars villains in the universe. I'm joined by the whole cast, except for Kevin. So Aww. we got the whole cast here. Um, right now, uh, at the bottom of the list, we have Dooku, Django, Annie, and CG Lucas from what? episode two. Number three is Sidious Vaxer? Vader. <laughs> the X is underneath the D. The X is underneath <laughs> the D. Maui and Palpatine is number, uh, number four. Maybe go in and clean this up. Tark Vader is number sense. three. Vader's choking hand is number two. And right now, Bubble Tea is number one. 
Where do we put Kylo Ren? I don't know Ren. what any of these mean anymore. I'll put him at number three. How's that? Is that weird? I, Underneath I, Vader's choking hand from Empire? Is that where it is? Mm, yeah. I, I would put this at number two because I like the... Uh, we, we finally get to see, excluding the prequels, because uh, the way they do this conflicting villain kind of thing is not great in those movies, but the like villain being conflicted throughout this movie and getting, getting to know him a little more, like I really like that. So here's my thing. I really like it. However... It's not just Kylo. Like I feel like we also need to include all Fox of the Snoke. Star Killer stuff and the the First Order. That's fair. And I feel like I like all of them more because they make us care about the stormtroopers and we see different angles. But that's the good side of them, not the bad side. The bad side mm. stuff I f- feel falls a little flat. Tur. However, the Kylo stuff is so good. Yep. So, yeah. But I, I'm with you though, because Kylo is this unique bad guy that we haven't really seen yet in a Star Wars franchise, right? He is this conflicted, layered, like deep bad guy who has demons that we're seeing, and he's almost more compelling than the protagonist. And he kills Han Solo. And then we get Hux, who is this cartoonish, fucking two dimensional general who does not need to be in this movie he's at all. He's an angry Weasley. Except someone was like, there has to be someone that has conflict with Kylo on the Starbase because remember when Vader had all those other people that were like calling him out in the first movie? We need that again. I, Hux see, is stupid. I, I like Hux. I, I like the dynamic of they, they don't have it as good as the Empire did. Like they are kind of playing pretend. It's not just Kylo trying to fake Vader. But it's I like that Hux is like faking Tarkin. It's yeah. faking all that. And I, I buy that. But what I don't buy is the exposition of the Republic and we're about to blow people up and all that stuff. That's where it falls flat, where it's like, oh, so it's not just pretending. You actually are doing the thing, yeah. and you're doing it weird. But you're also, like, a 25-year-old who is the head of this giant thing. Like, I don't buy it. Like, I get Kylo is in the position he's in because he has a unique and special ability in, with the dark side of the Force, and he's being played by Snoke. But Hux is just like, what? He's a fucking idiot. If Hux was, like, 55 Yeah, or if he was 55, I'd be like, okay, <laughs> this guy, this makes sense. Because, you know, in, in the Empire, there was, like, bureaucracy. And there was, like, these people who were this this council of old dudes that just thought everything was going to be fine. And guess what? It's not because these young people came up and fucking they got got. See, I, I think of it differently. It reminds me of uh, people that make movies and then YouTubers. Where it's just, like, these young kids are able to do more things because people did it before them. Mm. Okay. And, and it's just, like, he's this young kid that's like, oh, I can just copy elements. But then they brought in this. Snoke as, like the CEO cuz he's a, he's like managed companies yeah. in the past. But I guess I guess I don't know. I guess I missed the dynamic of the the bad guy having an even badder guy who is more capable leading him. Like I love the Tarkin Vader dynamic where Vader's yeah. like I respect this fucking guy well, we because he's been around for a long time. That. But Snoke was the emperor. And so like to me Hux just didn't is kind of a useless character. He's kind of a throwaway character in this. But I you know Yeah, I don't know. Well, I mean, what's number 3 right now, Andy? Uh t- uh Tark Vader. Tarkin and Vader. Tarkin and Vader. Tark Vader. 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 A New Hope. I'd put this above that. Okay. I'm down with that. Yeah, same. Sounds good to All me. Right, fuck it. Um, oh, oh, who? Um, but under the other. Uh, Kylo and... Uh, first Order. First just Order. The fucking Sexy Kylo. Sexy Kylo. Oh, no, that's the next one. Yeah. <laughs> Kylo and First uh, Order. Just put fucking from Sexy seven. Kylo. Yeah, right, chat, like, uh, shirtless Kylo will be in the next one. And that's oh, I also, yeah. I, I'm yeah. also, I'm also kind of confused by my ranking, because number one is apparently Boba Fett and uh, Palpatine, which is bu- Bubble Tea. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if that was from definitely from Empire. Jedi. No, that's Empire. No, definitely oh, sorry, from Empire. Jedi. That's Jedi. No, that is. How Jedi. is that Jedi? Because Vader's choking. Because Vader's minutes. choking hand is. <laughs> is that no, Empire? yeah, yeah. Vader's choking hand is Empire. And then Sidious Vaxer. Oh, never mind. That's. I think Vader's choking three. hand was uh, New Hope. No, no it's, Empire. it's Empire because he's Tarkin. killing oh, like, all of these generals. Right. That's right. Yeah. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Maybe we need to revote. We're good to go. We'll do that. We're good to go. All right. Seven syllables in the middle. You'll need five for the first and last line. If you're not poetic, no need to fret it. Haikus don't need to rhyme. Listen up. Kai Lo is cool. Uh, Kai Lo is, is cool. cool. He's really cool, man. <laughs> uh, Lee Polar, you can go to patreon.com slash kinda funny uh, to write your review in haiku form, just like Lee Polaro did. I'm Lee Polaro. <laughs> Why? BB 8 is great. <laughs> Kylo is very emo. Han died, and I cried. Oh, fuck, I did too, Lee Polaro. I wish I wish uh, Lee Palero rhymed something with emo. Uh, Justin Marshall writes in and says, "Let's try this again. Haiku for episode seven. Always two there are. So he has two here. Always two in there are. Uh, Raise no Mary Sue compared with Darth's Death Star v Luke. Five. Beats one. No, I think it's v Luke, like verses. But oh. v is only one syllable. Let me just read this again. Raise no Mary Sue compared with Death Star v Luke." Beats one injured dude. 
Okay. 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 Like I, li- I like I like that you actually tried to have some criticism. Sure. There. Good. Uh, Ray waits for her fam, steals the Falcon, then meets Han. Oh no no, no. okay okay. Han. There's yeah, yeah he. <laughs> He wants me to pronounce it like Lando says it. So Ray waits for her fam, steals the Falcon, then meets Han, finds Luke on Isle Land. <laughs> Island. <laughs> I guess, yeah. yeah, Island. <laughs> I appreciate the the effort, Justin Marshall. Terrible. I appreciate the effort. Uh, let's go to Daniel Edmonds, Ray Finn, Poe, Kylo, a brand new generation. Let's go, doggy dog. Let's go, doggy dog. Let's go, doggy, doggy dog. dog. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Uh, Ignacio Rojas says, uh, Luke goes to exile while evil tyrants take power. He did learn from Yoda. It's true. Uh, and then Party McFly says, damn, this movie's fun. Why so few with this franchise? Let's get it, JJ. Let's get it, JJ. Let's get it, JJ. Now it's time to rank the Star Wars universe. Currently, we have number one, The Empire Strikes Back. Number two, A New Hope. Number three, Return of the Jedi. Number four, Revenge of the Sith. Number five, The Phantom Menace. Number six, Attack of the Clones. Uh, Kevin is not here, but he told me that he puts it at number four mm. in between Return of the Jedi and Revenge of the Sith. He said that uh, he really likes it. He thinks it's really good, but it is a little too similar to A New Hope for his tastes. I would wholeheartedly agree. I think this movie is leaps and bounds, first off, ahead of anything in the prequels, but I can't, in good conscience, put it in front of, uh, above Return of the Jedi. I think Return of the Jedi, for all of its faults, which it had a few, uh, is... is f- is so strong because of how it wraps up Luke Skywalker's uh, uh, character arc. I love that there's that one moment where he's like, where he has, um, he's going to strike his dad down, he's going to kill his dad, and and Lord Sidious is like, strike him down, and like, do all that stuff, and he goes, no, I am a Jedi Knight, like my father before me, and he throws his lightsaber away, and that's such a power, like, at that point, he finally becomes, it's the culmination of everything he's worked for in the last three films, and it's wonderful, and we don't get a moment like that in this. In fact, this movie, Force Awakens, is great, starts off great, and then kind of slowly declines as we get into the third act, and by the third act, you're like, why is any of this happening? And that's unfortunate, but it's a really, really fun romp until that point. Yeah, I can't believe that I'm saying this, but I feel like watching these movies back to back to back makes me realize how good this one is, despite its flaws. And I agree with you. I think that there's no scene in the entire franchise that's as powerful or as good. And it is like why Star Wars is not just a movie franchise. It's actually fantastic filmmaking is the throne room scene. Yeah, it's great. With the Emperor and Luke and all that stuff. And I don't think anything can ever match that. I hope something can in nine. I doubt it. But like that is just so, so great. It's fantastic um, that I feel like it really pushes Jedi up so much. Um, but watching them and being critical, I think that it's it would be crazy for me to not put Force Awakens above Return of the Jedi. And I actually think that it's, it's not above A New Hope for me because uh, I think A New Hope is just so consistent throughout the entire thing where this does kind of trail off. Um, but I think this, it's, it's a lot closer to A New Hope than I would have ever expected. I'm I'm gonna be a little crazy horny boy too. Oh, I'm yeah. gonna put this above Return of the Jedi Ooh, because crazy. I don't think it's gonna be <laughs> above Return of the Jedi. But I, I I could say this is a movie. You know, this harkens back to our MCU rankings, where which is a better movie and which movie would you rather watch again and again? Right. And this is a movie that I would rather watch more than Return of the Jedi. I think A New Hope and Empire are more consistent in their storytelling, like you were mentioning. But again, at Someone like me who didn't really grow up watching a lot of these movies back, uh, you know, as a kid, I don't remember watching them a whole lot. So the the lore was never really super important to me. I just cared that they were cool spaceships shooting at each other. And this movie does more of that. You know, this is the marvelization of the Star Wars universe. And I, I just love what J.J. did with the franchise. And he made it fun again. I thought it was such a tough task to bring back Star Wars and make it good. Um, and yeah, this movie's just a lot more rewatchable for me. And uh, totally agree with all your criticisms. It does trail yeah. off at the very end, but I still think everything else is so fucking strong. I mean, there's, there's no doubt it's a fun movie, and there's no doubt that JJ directed the hell out of this, and it's got beautiful visuals and and fun characters that are that are worth watching. But I just don't. I, I think it's I think it's a a very very good copy of something that was great. And to me, Return of the Jedi has faults. It's not it's not the best of the original trilogy by any stretch of the imagination, but I think it is the f- a, a very fitting third act to the original trilogy that is just is perfect. And it, like when you look at it all together, it's like, yeah, there, there's some things you can criticize about it. The but that act. ending with Return of the Jedi, the the three planes of action that are happening, it just works and it's so 
fucking powerful when he literally when Luke literally takes that lightsaber and throws because he knows he's not going to beat the Emperor. He just throws it away and says, "You've lost because you you can't get me to turn. I'm a Jedi like my father before me." It's such a fucking in your face like no matter how hard you try. I'm never going to be what you want me to be. You've lost. And that's arguably And that's him accepting being a Jedi. And that's what it means to be a Jedi to him is that even though I'm going to fucking die, I'm holding true to the person I know I am. I'm a Jedi Knight. And it's so good. That's probably my favorite part of all of Return of the Jedi. Also, the speeder bikes were dope. Don't forget about this. I mean, just a a lot of Endor just really fell off for me. Where I I enjoy the worst parts of... Uh, Force Awakens more than I enjoy the worst parts of Jedi. Yeah, and, and me, me too. And so I think that the, the third act is so fucking fantastic. And even the first act is fantastic of Jedi. But there's a, a long portion in the middle that like doesn't really give us too much. And the things that it gives us, I feel, isn't totally consistent with uh, the ones before it. Um, so... Barrett, the other the whole factor on this real one. Quick, <laughs> real quick, the last thing that I want to say about Force Awakens is that uh, in talking about like uh, you just said like it's a copy of what came before it, like I feel like it it's a copy of so many elements, but at the end of the day, it's the characters that make it special, and they're not copies. And the characters are all so great it's in this true. movie the entire time. It's like, true. It's not just bits or pieces, and I, that is a. Uh, a task that I don't think that any of us expected Force Awakens to be able to accomplish. We thought that they could be better than the prequels. It was, obviously. But, like, they created characters that are special to us in the same way that the characters from the original trilogy are. I agree. So, before this uh, in review, I, I wouldn't have put this above any of the original tri- trilogy movies. But when it was going back to Return of the Jedi, it was like, oh, there's a lot of interesting... Looking at it through a critical eye, right, and not just enjoying it as a Star Wars fan and whatnot, there were a lot of choices that they made throughout that movie. It was like, oh, yeah, that this would have been so much cooler if they did this, this, and this. And there was a lot of – they had great closure with uh, Luke's character and Vader's character and, like, the wrapping up of taking down Palpatine together. But then everything else around that wasn't, like – I don't think was nearly as good as what they did with Luke. Uh, and so the reason I think I will put this above Force Awakens uh, or put uh, Force Awakens above Return of the Jedi is because of how quickly they sell us on these characters, how uh, this is kind of a copy of tropes from past Star Wars movies, but the way that the context is different and the characters are different and the journey, the personal journeys that they are going on are way different than what they are really doing in A New Hope. And like we were saying at the very beginning of this interview, they sell us on four different characters in the span of like 15 minutes. And I don't think, honestly, I don't think any Star Wars movie does that. And I think that's like in itself like very, very impressive. Uh, So, yeah, Force Awakens is uh, above Return of the Jedi for me. So I like it. shock the world. Yeah, I let's know. let's do the vote then. Start. Barrett, I would have thought you of all people would have been. On I my know, side. I, and I know my dad is gonna fucking Your dad text me is, in six hours. And he's punching gonna, the fucking yeah. computer screen right. He now. We also lost movie. half of the audience, guys. Like, they're <laughs> gonna hate us. They are, they're not <laughs> is happy. it better than Revenge of the Sith? Raise your hand. But still like the video. We all we <laughs> all raise raise our hands. Is it better than Return of the Jedi? Raise your hand. Me, Andy, and Barrett raise your hand. Kevin and Nick do not. The current rankings of the Star Wars universe are kind of funny. Number one, Empire Strikes Back. Number two, A New Hope. Number three, The Force Awakens. Number four, Return of the Jedi. Number five, Revenge of the Sith. Number six, The Phantom Menace. And number seven, Attack of the Clones. Uh, Like I was saying earlier, next week we are not going to be doing uh, a Star Wars movie in review because there's two episodes of Mandalorian next week. One is uh, premiering Tuesday. One's premiering Friday. Uh, We will be doing reviews of those instead. We didn't want to have too many in reviews in a week, so... We had the two movies this week, the two episodes next week, and then after that, it will be uh, Rogue One and Mandalorian. So, get fucking hyped. Until then, may the force be with you. Thank you.